Dark, ominous clouds brewed over a palace. Thunder rumbled in the sky and lightning bolts burst through the cloudy masses. Inside the palace hall, the emperor and his wife waited anxiously with a look of concern on their faces. In front of them, on a bed, was a body of a boy with a ray of blue energy erupting out from him and shooting toward the ceiling. An elderly man with long white hair stood beside the body performing a ritual. The boy groaned and clenched his teeth in pain as markings that glowed blue and purple spread across his body. They wrapped around his arm and formed a spiral in the center of his palm. After it was over, the old man approached the emperor and wife and informed them that their son, Prince Yuan, had managed to survive the ordeal, a ritual that happened every three years, and told them that he would now be fine for the next three years. The emperor's wife sighed as relief washed over her. However, the emperor was still not entirely at ease and asked the elderly man if he could sense Zhou Yuan's eight meridians since Zhou Yuan was already 13. And for a kid of his age, usually, the eight meridians are shaped by now. The old man regretfully shook his head and told them that he still couldn't sense them. The couple was distressed upon hearing that. The emperor furrowed his brows, and the empress's eyes widened in shock. The empress coughed, showing that she was growing weak. The old man urged her not to be so sad because she had just used up a lot of blood essence just now to nourish her son. But she simply turned to her husband and started sobbing. She asked why their son had to suffer such misery, mainly since he carried the blessings of the sacred dragon. She buried her face in her husband's chest and continued to sob, crying about how the prince's eight meridians hadn't even been shaped yet and that she feared that the prince wouldn't survive after three years. So does it mean I only have three years left? A voice from behind spoke. All three of them turned and were bewildered to find the prince awake. He sat up on his bed and observed the glowing spiral mark on his hand. He had overheard their conversation and asked his mother and father if they could tell him what happened to his body. The emperor contemplated the question for a moment before finally yielding. He said with a solemn look on his face that it was the rancorous dragon's poison. The prince was shocked as he heard this. He continued that it was time to tell the prince the truth. He began by asking the prince if he knew about the Great Wu Empire. The Great Wu Empire was one of the most powerful nations in the boundless continent. It used to be a tributary nation of their Great Zhou Empire 15 years ago. The prince was amazed to hear that their empire was so powerful 15 years ago and asked what happened during those 15 years. The emperor continued and said that the Great Wu Empire suddenly staged an armed rebellion, but in less than a year, the Great Wu Empire was defeated and driven back to this place. The emperor explained that the rebellion started because of a prophecy in the Wu family that said, The Great Wu will rise when the python and sparrow devour the dragon. The emperor's expression turned intense as he told Prince Yuan that the prince was the sacred dragon that would be devoured by the python and the sparrow. The prince sat in his bed confused. The emperor admitted that at first, even he didn't understand what the prophecy meant. Then one day, the army of the Wu family approached the walls of their great Zhou city. But instead of laying siege to the city immediately, they waited. Prince Yuan asked the emperor what they were waiting for. The emperor responded that they were waiting for Prince Yuan's birth. The unexpected answer took Yuan by surprise. The empress, still with tears in her eyes, continued the story and said that on the day Prince Yuan was born, extraordinary astronomical events occurred. Purple clouds flourished in the sky, and his body was wrapped up in dragon's chi. She exclaimed that it was the sign of the sacred dragon. When Prince Yuan was born, his eight meridians had been opened, and he had reached the chi cultivation realm directly. He was the unprecedented sacred dragon of the Zhou family. Overwhelmed by the knowledge, Yuan asked why couldn't they find the eight meridians in his body now. When Prince Yuan was born, the wife of the king of the Great Wu Empire also gave birth to a boy and a girl. The boy was wrapped in the chi of a dragon-like python, and the girl's body was covered in the chi of a spiritual sparrow. The wife of the Great Wu Empire's king had carried the children for three years, but waited to give birth to them till that day. It was said that children born on the same day can devour each other's kismet. The great Zhou Empire had not been their only target. They also wanted the dragon of the Zhou family, and Prince Yuan was the reason they remained dormant for the past hundred years. The prince was taken aback by his father's words as he began to understand his situation. The emperor emphasized how the great Wu Empire deprived Prince Yuan of his sacred dragon's kismet, and they hid in the dark for hundred years to plan that conspiracy. The emperor hesitated to continue for a moment. The old man interjected and requested that he be allowed to continue the story. The old man proceeded. 
On the fateful day, the emperor of the great Wu Empire arrived at the great Zhou city and made many people in the city his hostages. He wanted to take away Zhou Yuan's sacred dragon's kismet in front of his parents. But to save Zhou Yuan, his father battled the emperor of the great Wu Empire at the foot of the great Zhou Mountain. Despite his efforts, Zhou Yuan's father was defeated by the emperor and ended up losing an arm. The emperor of the Wu Empire feared that someone might ruin Zhou Yuan's kismet, so he left his father alive. Zhou Yuan's father gritted his teeth, enraged from remembering the humiliation he had faced that day, while his wife clung to him, coughing as tears streamed down her face. The empress's coughing worsened, and she began spitting out blood. Zhou Yuan was alarmed and yelled out, asking her if she was okay. The old man, also distressed, requested her not to be so agitated, and he asked the emperor to put her on the bed so he could stabilize her blood and qi. As he did so, the old man reminded Zhou Yuan about how to save him. His father had risked his life and fought desperately. The old man also added that Zhou Yuan's mother, the empress, had also been deprived of her kismet, and ever since then, she had nourished Zhou Yuan from her own blood, which seriously undermined her vitality. She had lost 36 years of her lifespan in the past 12 years. Now she only had less than 10 years to live. I see, Yuan said, looking down, seething with fury at the brutality of the emperor of the great Wu Empire. But for him, the worst thing of all, he pictured his mother and what she had to go through as he clawed at his bedsheet, was that the emperor of Wu had persecuted his mother. He looked up with a fierce determination in his as he vowed that the Wu family would pay for everything they'd done. The emperor carefully sat his wife down. Her health had gotten worse. Zhou Yuan asked him if there was anything they could do to restore his mother's health. The emperor, with his head facing down and a dejected look on his face, said that the precious herbs needed to prolong the empress's life were very rare. And besides that, the great Zhou empire was no longer as powerful as it once was. Ever since that fateful day, the Zhou family had been in decline and the great Wu Empire had flourished. Zhou Yuan's father compared them to ants who could barely survive by hiding in the palace. Yuan was discouraged by his father's words. He pondered if their only choice was to wait for their doom. He thought that eventually they would all be cornered and killed by the Wu family, wondering if that was their fate. No, he decided with determination, rejecting their fate and breaking the chains of destiny. He decided that the rancorous dragon's poison didn't matter, and he didn't care if his eight meridians were still unavailable. He looked up with an unwavering resolve and promised that, as long as there was hope, he would never give up, and he would take back everything that the Wu family had taken from them. He asked his father if he was sure that Zhou Yuan couldn't become a source master. Zhou Yuan was sure that he had to change his family's situation, but he also knew for sure that his lofty ambitions would be based on his mighty strength. He was motivated to obtain this power. The ultimate strength between the heavens and the earth was mastered by people called the Source Masters. The Source Masters trained the eight meridians in their bodies, which allowed them to make use of the Source Qi between the heavens and earth, and use that to generate unimaginably powerful strength. Zhou Yuan presumed that because of the rancorous dragon's poison, the eight meridians in his body were still unavailable to him, and that prevented him from training. He asked his father again if he was absolutely sure that he could not become a source master. His father looked at Yuan, amazed by his resolution, and asked him if he was determined not to give up, to which Zhou Yuan nodded. His eyes glimmered with hope. The emperor put his hand on Yuan's shoulder, told him that he was proud to have him as his son, and decided that if his son didn't wish to give up, then he, Zhou Qing, would do his best to help him. Zhou Yuan was surprised by his father's response, because it implied that there was still a way. He asked his father if he knew of a way to solve their problem. His father said that he did, but he warned him not to get his hopes up because he was not sure if his method would work or not. Zhou Yuan asked his father what this mysterious method was. His father told him to just go with him during the ancestral worship three days later. However, he said that he also had a requirement for Yuan. Zhou Yuan asked what this requirement was, and his father told him that no matter if the method was effective or not, Yuan must keep practicing the art of source patterns. If he could manage to reach a high level in source patterns, then the rancorous dragon's poison may be suppressed. So during the time that Zhou Yuan's eight meridians were unavailable, he practiced the art of source patterns. Even though most people went through similar training, there were actually many ways to train source patterns. Zhou Yuan knew that his father worried that Yuan would give up if he found out that after all that training, his eight meridians were still unavailable. 
The emperor escorted his wife out of the place. The sky had cleared up. He told Zhou Yuan that he could take a break today, but tomorrow he would resume learning, and three days from then, his father would take him to the ancestral grave. As his mother and father left the hall, Zhou Yuan thought about how the frustration and helplessness all this time had made his father look more like an old man. Zhou Yuan cursed the emperor of the Great Wu Empire and decided that he would make him pay for what he had done. The next day at the school of the Great Zhou Empire, the morning sun shone over the building as Prince Yuan sat in a class with the other students. This was the number one school in the Great Zhou Empire. All gifted people were allowed to attend, which meant that even ordinary citizens were allowed to attend. Zhou Yuan had in his hand a source pattern pen. It was a beautiful large brush with a decorative golden ferrule and long golden bristles. It was the most essential tool for drawing source patterns. The teacher, an old man with long white hair and glasses, told them that source patterns were patterns outlined by the source pattern pen, which was activated by the user's soul energy, and all strokes drawn by a source pattern pen were drawn using soul energy. He cautioned the students to stay calm whilst drawing the source patterns and concrete their soul energy to the pen point, always controlling the pen with their heart. That was the only way they could mobilize the source chi between the heavens and earth. The teacher pointed to some patterns drawn on paper hanging on a wall. Those were the patterns the students learned a month ago, and the teacher told them to continue practicing them, and that he hoped that they could master one of the patterns today. All the kids cried and complained, frustrated that they had to practice soul patterns again. The kids grumbled and protested, saying that consuming soul energy felt terrible and that it was too painful. The teacher scolded them and told them to stop complaining and start practicing, and they all complied obediently. While the other students seemed weary from the practice, Yuan concentrated intently. A faint blue light appeared on his forehead. His pen flowed through the paper like water, tracing patterns with elegance and grace. Since Zhou Yuan's eight meridians were still unavailable to him, he had spent all of his time acquiring knowledge of the source patterns. He had made tremendous progress compared to his peers. When Zhou Yuan was deprived of his kismet, his soul had not been damaged. And contrarily, he had a stronger soul now. As Zhou Yuan placed down the last stroke of his pattern, the brush tip of the pen and ink he had just put down glowed a radiant gold. Just then, the teacher, who had been standing right behind Zhou Yuan, erupted with delight, marveling at Zhou Yuan's iron skin pattern and calling his pattern a masterwork. Zhou Yuan jumped up, startled by the teacher's sudden reaction. The teacher announced to the class, telling the other students to be more efficient like Zhou Yuan. The other students joined in, awestruck by his pattern. They praised him. Some were even disgruntled because their work was nowhere near as good as Zhou Yuan's. A student from amongst them smirked and laughed as he spoke, disagreeing with the teacher. The remark caught Zhou Yuan's attention. He turned around to see who it was. It was a student behind him. He had light brown hair, and he twirled his source pattern pen in his fingers with a cocky smile on his face. The student claimed that Zhou Yuan was only better because all the other students focused on the training of their eight meridians, so they couldn't spend all their time acquiring source patterns like Zhou Yuan. He said doing so would be putting the cart before the horse. He taunted Zhou Yuan by asking him if he was right. Zhou Yuan and the student glared at each other. The other student held his smug expression. His name was Xu Lin. The tension was palpable, and the classroom erupted with murmurs. The teacher shouted at the students to be quiet. The two of them yielded. After class was over, a young girl approached Prince Yuan, addressing him as His Highness. The girl had long brown hair and soft blue eyes. She wore a pink dress and had a gentle smile. Her name was Su Yu Wei. Zhou Yuan's face lit up when he saw her. She sat down at his desk and they talked. He asked her how her grandfather was and she told him that he had fully recovered and wanted to invite Zhou Yuan to their home. Zhou Yuan accepted and said that he would visit during the next vacation. The other students watched this happen and wondered why Su Yu Wei was sitting so close to Zhou Yuan. Su Yu Wei's face fell. Something was bothering her. It was a memory from one year ago. Her grandfather was very ill and they didn't have any money. Su Yu Wei knocked on the door of every physician begging for help, but no one responded. She was disheartened on the streets, crying in the rain. When she had almost lost all hope, a man walking by showed some compassion and placed an umbrella over her providing her some solace from the battering rain. The man kicked open the door that Su Yue was previously knocking on and demanded that the physician treat her grandfather at once. The man was Prince Yuan. Su Yue saw him bravely step up to help her. 
Before, Su Yue did not have a good impression of, and in fact, hated young boys that came from wealthy families and thought they were good for nothing. But since that day, Zhou Yuan's confident and imposing stance was embedded into her heart. Prince Yuan recommended Su Yue to the school of the great Zhou Empire when he sensed her talent for training. And one month later, Su Yue became a genius because she managed to open her first meridian in just that time. She devoted herself to her training so that in the future, she could repay the prince's kindness. Su Yue was lost in thought as she reminisced about that day, and she didn't notice that all the while, she had been mindlessly stacking books on top of Yuan's desk. Zhou Yuan asked her how high she planned on stacking the books, which knocked her out of her dazed, and she was extremely embarrassed. She apologized and said she would tidy it up. The prince told her that it was okay, and said that he heard that she had opened that third meridian. He was pleased and wished her well on the big test, which was in two months, by saying that he hoped she would open the fourth meridian and become the top ten in the test. Su Yue thought that she had done all this for Yuan's sake. Nervousness crept up on her face. Yuan noticed this and stopped what he was saying to ask her what was wrong, to which she timidly responded that she had lost her opportunity. Zhou Yuan was flabbergasted by hearing this and asked what had happened. She explained that several days ago, when Xu Lin had slandered Yuan, she had gone up to confront him. So he challenged her under the condition that if she won, he would apologize to Zhou Yuan, but if he won, then she would lose her opportunity. Xu Lin, unashamed, defeated Su Yue using his source weapon. Yuan was appalled when he heard this and stood up immediately. He called out to Xu Lin and went to confront him. Zhou Yuan was infuriated, and he asked Xu Lin how he could trick a girl like that. He condemned Xu Lin and called him a bastard for doing so. Xu Lin cheekily feigned innocence and said it was fair and he had earned the opportunity with his strength. He refused to give it back even if the prince asked him to. Zhou Yuan turned contentious and asked Xu Lin if he had the guts to fight him. Xu Lin thought that he had won the fight against Su Yue because she had just opened her third meridian, but it would be foolish to fight the prince. He had nothing to gain from fighting him. Xu Lin dismissed Zhou Yuan's challenge and said he wasn't interested. Just then, Yuan slammed a trinket onto the table. It was a round green stone called the Source Collection Jade. Zhou Yuan declared that he would be betting the jade. If Xu Lin wins, he gets the Source Collection Jade, and if Zhou Yuan wins, then Su Yue gets her place back. Tempted by the Source Collection Jade and thinking that Zhou Yuan was brash and idiotic for putting it up, Xu Lin accepted the offer. He sarcastically said that since Yuan was just giving him the jade, it would be disrespectful to decline. He also warned that if Zhou Yuan got injured, then he was not to be blamed for it. Fearing that Zhou Yuan might get hurt, Su Yue tried to stop him by saying that he shouldn't have to fight since it was her fault. Other classmates chimed in, wondering what Zhou Yuan was thinking, challenging Xu Lin when he hadn't even opened a single meridian. They were sure that Xu Lin would use this opportunity to humiliate the prince. The two combatants faced off in the arena of the school of the great Zhou Empire. A crowd gathered around the arena out of curious anticipation, waiting for the spectacle to unfold. Xu Lin confirmed that a large crowd had gathered because he had invited some of his friends for publicity. He thought that a large crowd would mean that more people would see Zhou Yuan embarrass himself. But Prince Yuan stood in the arena with confidence and complete focus. A strong gust of wind encircled him. The crowd questioned if this was even a fair fight since the prince hadn't even opened a single meridian while Xu Lin had opened two. Whenever a meridian is opened, the person's strength becomes several times higher than that of an ordinary person. A single meridian opened could easily equal the strength of ten ordinary men. And Xu Lin had two meridians opened, so his victory was pretty much guaranteed. The daunting image of Xu Lin loomed over the battlefield. Su Yue from the audience showed her apprehension and meekly asked the prince if he was really going to do this. Prince Yuan turned to her and with determination-filled eyes told her that he could not back down. Otherwise, he would make a very cowardly prince. His confidence inspired Su Yue, and she grew more hopeful. Xu Lin mocked the prince by expressing his surprise that the prince actually showed up. Prince Yuan remarked on Xu Lin's overconfidence. Xu Lin retorted that he didn't expect the prince to get so worked up over a girl and that his decision was irrational. Zhou Yuan told him to shut up and start the fight. He even allowed him to attack first. Zhou Yuan's tenacity made Xu Lin uneasy. He suspected that Zhou Yuan had lost his mind because he was scared and decided that he would start his attack immediately. Xu Lin lunged at Prince Yuan. His eyes were wild. He pulled his fist back, ready to throw it at the prince, and yelled that he would knock the prince down with one punch. Yuan put up his hands to block a direct attack. 
The crowd gasped in shock. They couldn't understand why Zhou Yuan decided to go on the defense and were fearful that the force from the attack would break his arm. The blow connected with full force. The punch sent Zhou Yuan sliding back across the arena. A guttural scream echoed and the crowd began sweating from the stress. Unexpectedly, Xu Lin pulled his bruised fist back in pain and screamed with tears in his eyes that he was hurt and accused Yuan that he had hidden something up his sleeve. The crowd was surprised to realize that the painful scream earlier had not been Yuan but Xu Lin. Zhou Yuan looked up. His sleeve, blown back by the wind, revealed golden markings on his forearm. It was the iron muscle source pattern. The crowd was invigorated with interest. They were unaware that Zhou Yuan could draw source patterns on his body. Xu Lin asked him if this meant that Zhou Yuan was able to use source patterns. He asked how that could be possible. Zhou Yuan looked straight ahead and asked Xu Lin if he really thought he would be that feeble, especially since he had no open meridian in his body. Xu Lin scoffed and regained himself, declaring Yuan's source patterns to be an insignificant skill. He declared menacingly that he was about to show Zhou Yuan the real strength of an expert with open meridians. Su Yue and the crowd panicked. Strong energy swirled around Xu Lin, and the crowd verified that Xu Lin had indeed opened both of his meridians at the same time and fretted that Xu Lin may try to actually kill the prince. Zhou Yuan grew a little concerned. Xu Lin sneered at the prince and said that now the prince was truly feeble in front of him. He suggested to Zhou Yuan that he admit his defeat before he got hurt. Zhou Yuan brushed off Xu Lin's attempts at intimidation, seemingly unbothered, and claimed that since Xu Lin had attacked first the last time, he would attack first this time. The crowd could not believe the prince's audacity and urged him to just give up. Zhou Yuan kept his eyes on Xu Lin and with one unnaturally strong push, he darted toward Xu Lin with amazing speed. Xu Lin was caught off guard by Zhou Yuan's sudden agility. Su Yue recognized what had happened when her eyes caught something that glowed blue through Zhou Yuan's boots. She realized that Yuan had used an agility pattern. He thrusted his fist forward, and another golden pattern glowed on his hand. The crowd recognized this one to be the raging bull pattern. The crowd was astounded to see Zhou Yuan activate three source patterns in such a short period of time. Yuan's fist landed square on Xu Lin's stomach, knocking the wind out of him and sending him flying backward. The crowd gasped in amazement. Xu Lin crashed onto the floor with a loud thud outside the bounds of the area. Zhou Yuan stood there for a moment, smoke coming off his fist before he approached where Xu Lin lay on the ground. He looked down at Xu Lin and told him that it had just lost to a man who hadn't even opened one meridian. He reached into Xu Lin's pocket and took out a green trinket from his coat. He tossed it around in his hand and suggested to Xu Lin that maybe he shouldn't attend the big test because he would only find humiliation over there. The crowd erupted with cheers and applause. They had never expected the prince to win and that, too, defeat a Xu Lin who had two meridians opened with just source patterns. Xu Lin, still winded, tried to lift his head up to speak but couldn't muster the strength and collapsed back onto the floor. Yuan walked across the arena and hopped down on the platform and went to Su Yue. He handed her the trinket he had retrieved from Xu Lin's coat and told her not to lose it again. Su Yue looked at him with concern and mentioned his hands. He looked at his hand, which was shaking from the impact it had sustained. Zhou Yuan explained that because his meridians hadn't opened, his physique still wasn't strong enough to sustain damage like that. He hoped that he could solve the problem of his eight meridians at the ancestral grave because he was growing more frustrated with only being able to acquire source patterns. Su Yue offered to apply some medical ointment to his wound, to which the prince sheepishly refused, stating that he got nervous whenever she got too close to him. Su Yue felt insulted by this comment, claimed that she didn't know what Yuan was talking about, and excused herself. Zhou Yuan stopped her before she left and reminded her that she only had one month left to prepare for the big test. He told her that everyone was training very hard and offered to help her with her training and resources. She turned to Zhou Yuan. In his eyes, she seemed to sparkle with ethereal beauty. She thanked him for all that he had done for her, but reminded him of something he used to say, that they were just friends. Clearly, she was still offended about Zhou Yuan turning down her previous advance. Fine, Yuan accepted, thinking that she was just being stubborn. She smiled and left. After Su Yue had left, Zhou Yuan noticed something. He looked up to see a man right next to him with his hands folded in a greeting toward Zhou Yuan. The man was tall with long purple hair tied up in a bun, and he wore a long golden brown robe. He had a gentle expression on his face. The man was the son of Emperor Qi, and his name was Qi Yue. During these years, 
Qi Yue made a lot of friends in the school of the Great Zhou Empire. Zhou Yuan guessed that Qi Yue was probably the one backing Xu Lin. During Zhou Yuan's match in the arena, Qi had been spectating from atop a balcony. He remarked that he didn't expect Yuan to be so good at using source patterns. He was speaking to a girl leaning on a doorframe. The girl was Liu Shi, the daughter of Marquise Liu. She had long, straight black hair, and she wore a short, dark ombre dress. She shrugged off what Qi Yue had said that source patterns were just some insignificant tricks that held no weight. Qi Yue continued, now talking about Su Yue. He noted that she was a really gifted girl and that they should try to draw her over to their side. Liu Shi disregarded his proposition once again and said that Su Yue was just a lowly girl with three opened meridians and that if she didn't follow them, then they should just get rid of her. Liu Shi thought that Zhou Yuan was just a useless prince, satisfied with a bit of knowledge about source patterns. She revealed that Zhou Yuan wished to marry her, and she didn't understand why because she thought he was ridiculous. Qi Yue speculated that Zhou Yuan had lost faith in himself and was trying to cultivate a genius like Su Yue into an expert so he could rely on her in the future. A sinister glimmer appeared in Qi Yue's eyes as he watched over Yuan from the balcony. Qi Yue thought to himself that Zhou Yuan, the Zhou family's sacred dragon, had become a wasted dragon, which, if true, meant that the Zhou family was doomed. A horn blared. Ancestral Worship Day had arrived. Prince Yuan and his father were ready to set out on their horses. The ancestral worship was held in the imperial mausoleum of the great Zhou Empire. It was on the Green Mountain, which was protected by three large mountain ranges, the Green Mountain rose up like a giant spike that touched the sky. The place and its geomatic omens allowed the Zhou family to flourish in the very beginning. On the Green Mountain, there were 9,999 steps that led to the ancestral hall, which was hidden in the clouds. Prince Yuan and his father disembarked their horses and began their ascent, which took them 30 minutes. They arrived at the ancestral hall. Zhou Yuan followed his father's lead and offered incense and, on his knees, prayed to his ancestors. After completing his worship to his ancestors, Zhou Qing opened a secret stone door. Zhou Yuan was amazed to discover that there was an altar hidden deep inside the mountain. The two stepped into the altar. It was a grand opening with a large platform in the middle, inscribed with mystic symbols. Zhou Yuan recognized them as source patterns. When he tried to envision the source patterns in his mind, he found that a large amount of his soul energy had been consumed. Zhou Yuan was stupefied and wondered what this place was. Zhou Qing explained that in their family, there was a secret prophecy. The prophecy said that there was a lucky chance hidden somewhere in this room, a chance that could ensure eternal prosperity for their family, and the key to unlocking that lucky chance lay in the Zhou family bloodline. Zhou Qing cautioned that many previous emperors from the Zhou family had attempted to open it, but all of them had failed. Zhou Qing told Zhou Yuan that he had brought him here to try his luck, and that if he managed to unlock it, then the problem of his eight meridians would be solved. Zhou Yuan balled up his fist with determination and walked forward with conviction. Zhou Yuan sat down in the center of the platform and held his hand out. He made a small cut on his wrist and let a small stream of his blood drip out onto the source patterns etched in the ground. The source patterns began to glow brightly, and golden sparks flew out of them. Zhou Yuan started to feel dizzy, and his vision became blurry, but he held on by thinking about how this was his last chance and remembered his mother and father. He thought about all of the things their family had to suffer through. A loud bang was heard, and Zhou Yuan was entirely engulfed by the yellow glow. He strengthened his conviction, and the look in his eyes showed that he was fully determined to obtain the lucky chance. A huge beam of golden light showered down from the ceiling and wrapped around Zhou Yuan. His father could only watch in shock because just as suddenly as it had come, the beam of light dissipated and Zhou Yuan vanished along with it. Zhou Yuan had been whisked away by the dazzling light and then thrown out with tremendous force. He opened his eyes, still in a daze, and wondered about what had just happened. He was immediately perplexed by what he saw because, somehow, he had found himself in the middle of a lush, magical forest. A glowing butterfly made of light fluttered overhead, and Zhou Yuan wondered what this place was. Yuan noted that the forest seemed old. He was still befuddled by how he had arrived there since he was just in the ancestral hall a moment ago. Zhou Yuan suddenly became aware that the forest was uninhabited, but before he could fully remark on that, he noticed a figure lurking behind a tree. 
It was a young girl hidden in the shadows. She had long black hair that fell straight down and striking red eyes. Zhou Yuan was immediately struck by the appearance of her eyes and found himself filled with dread when he looked at them. He decided that it was better to remain cautious in that strange place. Zhou Yuan turned towards the girl, his head bowed and hands together. He politely asked her what this place was. He introduced himself and explained that he had arrived in the forest by accident. The girl remained silent. Zhou Yuan lifted his head and glanced at her. The girl stepped out from under the tree. She was adorned in an ethereal sky-blue gown that faded into purple. The dress flowed with the wind, but her expression remained cold. Zhou Yuan was awestruck by her beauty, and his demeanor changed. He bowed again and politely addressed her as, Young Lady. She repeated the statement back to him as though she was puzzled by what he had said. She began talking out loud to herself. She said that the old man was correct and someone really did come to that place as expected. Zhou Yuan was confused and asked her what she meant, but she simply turned around and started to walk away. She commanded Tun Tun to come with her, and a small orange pet rolled out of the bushing and followed her as she went off. Tun Tun was an unusual orange fluffy little creature. It went up, running to the girl, wagging its tail in excitement. Zhou Yuan was surprised. He hadn't expected a small beast to be hiding in the tree too. Zhou Yuan thought Tun Tun resembled a pet dog. Tun Tun turned and glared at Yuan. It jumped up onto a nearby rock and aggressively started barking at Zhou Yuan, but it was so tiny that it only came off as adorable. Zhou Yuan giggled at how cute Tun Tun was, which irritated Tun Tun even further and made him angrier. Tun Tun jumped up, opening his mouth monstrously large, and chomped down on the big rock he was just standing on, devouring it in a few bites. Zhou Yuan was dumbfounded to see such a small creature devastate a big rock like that and said that its teeth must be really impressive as he watched Tun Tun chew the rock. He bowed in nervous submission to Tun Tun. And Tun Tun, feeling proud that he had successfully intimidated Zhou Yuan, strutted back to the young girl, wagging its tail in joy. The girl turned back to Zhou Yuan and calmly told him that if he wanted to find his great opportunity, then he should follow her. Zhou Yuan was surprised to hear that and chased after her deep into the forest. He arrived at a small cottage in an empty field in the middle of the forest where an old man in a black robe and long black hair sat in front of the cottage. He seemed as though he had been waiting for Zhou Yuan's arrival. He looked up at Zhou Yuan with half-opened eyes. He announced that Yuan was finally here, but he hadn't expected him to be such a small kid with the chi of the sacred dragon. The old man remarked on what a pity it was that Zhou Yuan had been deprived of his kismet. His dragon root was ruined and how he had the rancorous dragon's poison in his body. He concluded by stating that Zhou Yuan looked miserable. Zhou Yuan was bewildered by the old man's ability to know all that just by looking at him. Tun Tun rubbed up playfully rubbed against the young girl's leg in admiration. The girl, annoyed by this, picked Tun Tun up and dropped it in a pot of water. Zhou Yuan composed himself and respectfully bowed to the old man, introducing himself. Zhou Yuan thought that given his abilities he must be an extraordinary man and Zhou Yuan became optimistic that the problem with his eight meridians might finally be solved. The old man continued and said that he had been expecting a member of the Zhou family. He fixed his eyes on Zhou Yuan and told him that he knew precisely what Yuan was thinking and that he could definitely help him solve the problem of his eight meridians. He paused before asking Zhou Yuan why he should help him at all. Zhou Yuan became anxious from the question. He speculated that since he was suddenly teleported here and because the old man anticipated his arrival, something must have transpired between the old man and the ancestors of the Zhou family. The old man scoffed at him angrily, called him arrogant, and asked me what qualified Yuan to make the old man wait for him. Zhou Yuan admitted that he didn't know the answer and guessed that the Zhou family prophecy was merely a shot in the dark, and since Zhou Yuan specifically was sent to this place when so many others failed, there must be reason. The old man sighed and leaned back into his, dejectedly commenting that he must be getting old now since he couldn't even intimidate a small kid. The young girl informed her grandpa that Zhou Yuan was only pretending to be calm and was, in reality, very scared. Zhou Yuan laughed nervously when the young girl called out his bluff. The old man said promised that he could solve the problem of Zhou Yuan's invisible eight meridians, but only under one condition. Zhou Yuan asked him what the condition was, showing a willingness to do whatever he had to. The old man told Zhou Yuan that he wanted him to take Yao Yao out of the forest and protect her in the future. He was referring to the young girl. Yao Yao seemed troubled and asked if that meant that the old man was going to leave her. 
Zhou Yuan, oblivious to how tense Yao Yao was, commented that her name sounded cute, which prompted Yao Yao to glare at him with disdain. The old man explained to Yao Yao that he had to leave for some business and therefore couldn't remain with her, so he assigned that task to Zhou Yuan. Yao Yao complained that Zhou Yuan was weak. Zhou Yuan overheard her say that and felt embarrassed. The old man defended Zhou Yuan by saying that even though he was weak now, his potential was limitless. Upset by the news, Yao Yao asked the old man if she would ever see him again in the future. The old man fell quiet and hesitated to answer. He gently patted her shoulder and said that they should talk about it later before returning his attention to Zhou Yuan and asking him if he had made his decision. Zhou Yuan bowed and boldly accepted, declaring that although he was weak now, he would still defend Yao Yao with his life. The old man laughed, pleased by Zhou Yuan's answer, and complimented his boldness. He stated that he was satisfied and held out a hand, a glowing blue orb of energy formed in his hand. Zhou Yuan was suddenly alarmed as the ground beneath him began to crumple and disappear. The old man bellowed that, satisfied by his answer, he would solve the problem of his eight meridians. Zhou Yuan, wide-eyed, gasped as he was sucked into a large chasm. A blue orb glowed at the bottom of the hole. A vicious black liquid shot up and enveloped him, wrapping around his foot while the old man's thunderous laughter boomed overhead. Zhou Yuan found himself unable to escape from the liquid and began to panic when he realized that the liquid was disintegrating his body. He thought the old man was trying to kill him. The liquid crept its way up to Yuan's face and began to cover his eyes. Zhou Yuan's vision blurred, and he felt that he was about to lose consciousness. Fear consumed him as he wondered if he was going to die here. He thought about his mom and dad. In a moment of inspiration, Zhou Yuan pushed away the thought of him dying. He was filled with determination and reminded himself that he still had to save his mother and avenge his father. He still had to take back the sacred dragon's kismet, so dying here was not an option for him. Just then, a golden light emanated from inside him. Eight strands of golden light that resembled a crawling dragon surrounded his body. Zhou Yuan thought that these could be his eight meridians. Suddenly the strands were gone, and Yuan envisioned his body floating in the void. It glowed golden, and an enormous dragon appeared next to him, its body radiating with blue energy encircling Yuan's. Eight points of light shone from within the dragon's body. Just as suddenly as before, the vision was gone. Zhou Yuan fell to his knees, the ground restored beneath his feet. He panted heavily with beads of sweat dripping from his face and his hands shaking. He stayed there on his knees in disbelief and thought to himself if his eight meridians had really returned. Zhou Yuan flashed back to his past. He thought back to when he was growing up, and all his peers were excited and overjoyed as they began the cultivation of their meridians. All his peers were leaving him behind, and although Zhou Yuan put on a brave face, he was saddened and envious of them because he had longed for the day that his meridians would open. He couldn't wait to step into the path of the great source Qi and master his powers. Back in the forest, the day he had longed for had finally arrived. Zhou Yuan was ecstatic that the gate of the source Qi was finally opened for him. The old man interrupted and explained that Zhou Yuan's eight meridians were already open when he was born. But when he met the catastrophes that happened that day, his meridians tried to protect Zhou Yuan and hid in the deepest parts of his body and would only show up when he was close to death. The old man confirmed that he did try to kill Zhou Yuan just now, and if his eight meridians had not opened at the last moment, he would have died. Zhou Yuan was terrified when he found out that he could have actually died. The old man asked him if Zhou Yuan had blamed him for not telling him that in advance. Zhou Yuan took a deep breath to calm himself and responded that as long as it meant that his eight meridians were restored, he was willing to take any risk, so it didn't matter if he knew in advance. The old man acknowledged that Zhou Yuan had a good temperament, but he cautioned him from being too optimistic. Zhou Yuan's eight meridians had returned, but they had still not been opened, and for Yuan, it would be even more difficult to open his meridians compared to an ordinary person. Zhou Yuan still chose to remain upbeat and said that at least he now had a better chance than before. Yao Yao interjected and told Zhou Yuan that it was okay that he couldn't cultivate his activated meridians just yet, because she too was unable to use her source qi. The old man attested that because, for some reason, Yao Yao couldn't use her source qi. He then added that despite that, she still should not be underestimated because he had passed on his skill in source patterns to her. She was very capable of using source patterns well enough that she could be Zhou Yuan's teacher. 
Zhou Yuan hadn't expected that a young, delicate-looking girl like her could be so skilled at using source patterns. The old man continued that, although it was more difficult for Zhou Yuan to open his eight meridians, he would be receiving some additional benefits compared to ordinary people. Zhou Yuan realized that the old man was really an expert. He perked up, and an idea started to form in his head. He began to groan and whine about how he was so far behind his peers and how he would have to spend a lot of time to be powerful enough to be able to protect Yao Yao. He was trying to elicit sympathy from the old man. The old man told him to quit his rambling and tell him what he wanted. Zhou Yuan humbly asked the old man if he could pass on some of his skills to him. The old man laughed, remarked on his cunning tactics, and teased him for being too greedy. Zhou Yuan was just relieved that the old man was not angry. He continued to fake being weak and useless, attempting to convince the old man to pass some of his skills to him. Yao Yao was amused by Zhou Yuan's theatrics and persistence, and requested her father that if he didn't wish that she ended up protecting him, then it would be best for him to grant Yuan's request. Zhou Yuan beamed with appreciation at Yao Yao. The old man's face suddenly became stern. He said he agreed with Yao Yao, then paused before declaring that he wouldn't pass on his skill to an outsider. Zhou Yuan immediately fell to his knees and said that to not be an outsider, he would even take up a position as the old man's apprentice. The old man once again commended Zhou Yuan for being clever and reluctantly somewhat agreed to take him on as his apprentice since it was already predestined that they would meet in that forest. Zhou Yuan was delighted. Zhou Yuan prostrated in front of the old man to show his appreciation and his devotion to being the old man's apprentice. The old man said that since Yuan had made such a serious vow, he was going to reward him with his skills. He pointed at Zhou Yuan, and a beam of golden light shot out from his finger and struck Zhou Yuan's head. The old man exclaimed that all eight of his meridians would be available, and on top of that, the old man would also impart his art of qi yi attraction to him. Zhou Yuan's eyes opened wide with bewilderment as an incredible amount of information flowed into his head. In an instant, he had acquired all knowledge about the dragon suction art. Yuan was awestruck simply thinking about the extraordinary skills he had just acquired. The old man said that he noticed traces of source patterns on Zhou Yuan's body and asked him if he was interested in source patterns. Zhou Yuan was alerted as soon as he heard him talk about source patterns, something he was somewhat adept at. He said the art of source patterns was profound and shouldn't be underestimated. The old man told Zhou Yuan that arrogant people often look down on the art of source patterns because it was very difficult to master or even understand. The old man continued saying that those people didn't know that soul energy was the core of the art of source patterns. He said that mastering source patterns would complement the art of the source master. The old man pointed out that Zhou Yuan's soul energy was vibrant and exuberant and deduced that Yuan was very gifted at using source patterns. He expressed that he would also impart the soul intensification art to him. Zhou Yuan was astounded. Patterns and symbols streamed into his head, and soon the chaotic divine mill contemplation art was also engraved in Zhou Yuan's mind. He could sense just how incredible these two training arts were, and he marveled at the fantastic opportunity the old man had provided him. He bowed again and profusely expressed his gratitude to the old man. The old man fell silent for a moment. He thought hard for a while and then hesitantly pulled out a source pattern pen from his coat. It was a small brush pen with a dark stem and thin white bristles. It had a bronze ornate ferrule and markings etched along the handle. The old man offered the source pen as a gift to Zhou Yuan and explained that not only was this a source pen but also a source weapon. Zhou Yuan was surprised that a source pen that small could be a dangerous weapon. The old man remarked that he didn't expect Zhou Yuan to underestimate the source weapon implying that, similar to the source weapon, he was also quite small but deceivingly strong. The old man turned serious and told Zhou Yuan that this was no ordinary source weapon but a sacred source weapon, and its name was the Heaven Element Pen. Zhou Yuan was shocked. He couldn't believe that that old black pen was a sacred source weapon at the top level of all source weapons. All source weapons had different levels. They were all classified into four different categories. Ordinary, dark, heaven, and sacred, with each being stronger than the last. Zhou Yuan had a hard time understanding how a small black pen could be a sacred level source weapon. He inspected the pen in the old man's hand and noted that the pen didn't seem to have any power. The old man reiterated that it used to be a sacred source weapon. He told Zhou Yuan that the source pen had weathered many storms and had almost gotten seriously damaged and destroyed in combat at one point. Zhou Yuan was bemused by the story. 
The old man referred to the source patterns etched onto the pen and told him that the markings stood for the power of this heaven element pen. He instructed Zhou Yuan that he could restore the power of the pen by feeding it with the souls of the source beasts. If all of the nine source patterns light up, the power of the heaven element pen will be fully restored, and once that happened, Zhou Yuan would learn to use the heaven element pen as a weapon. Zhou Yuan was thrilled to be receiving the source pen and thanked the old man. He mentioned that he still didn't know the old man's name and asked him. He told Zhou Yuan that his name was Kang Yuan, and that he also had two other apprentices that could be considered Zhou Yuan's seniors. He hoped that Zhou Yuan would meet them in the future. Yao Yao looked at Kang Yuan with mournful eyes, but before she could form her thoughts into words, Kang Yuan answered. He told her that he knew she had a lot of questions, but now was not a good time to ask them. He told her that all good things must come to an end, and handed her a green jade pendant with a lotus drawn on it. Kang Yuan explained that in the future, she'd get the opportunity to have all her questions answered and left her with an ominous message, saying that if the fire lotus drawn on the pendant started to burn, then they were about to find her. Yao Yao, troubled by this message, cried out, asking him to tell her who they were and why they were coming after her, but Kang Yuan remained silent. He addressed Zhou Yuan and told him not to let Yao Yao open the seal and use her source Qi. He was referring to the pendant he had just given her, otherwise calamities would be drawn to Zhou Yuan. Zhou Yuan assured Kang Yuan that he could rest easy. Kang Yuan told him that if in the future he had trouble with his training, he could always go to Yao Yao for advice because, over the years, Yao Yao had acquired the essence of Kang Yuan's knowledge. He jokingly added that Zhou Yuan should only do that when Yao Yao was in a good mood. Suddenly his voice became serious. He looked away from Yao Yao, touched her hand, and ordered her to go. Yao Yao was stunned by the sudden shift and wondered why he wanted her to go immediately. Yuan, too, became concerned by the old man. Kang Yuan yelled at the two of them in a fury, telling them to go immediately. He lifted his hand and gathered a ball of energy in it. Kang Yuan cast blue glowing circles made of source patterns onto the ground. Zhou Yuan caught on that the old man was trying to send them away and speculated that it must be for a dire reason and that something grave was about to happen there, dangerous enough to prompt the old man to rush to send the two of them away. A circle of energy formed around Zhou Yuan's feet and a bright light began to envelop him. Yao Yao gave Kang Yuan one last sorrowful glance and he looked at her calmly and, this time somewhat unsure, he told her that maybe they could meet again. She looked down having finally accepted his farewell. The light beamed out aggressively through the ground, and Kang Yuan reminded Zhou Yuan one last time to honor his promise of protecting Yao Yao. A resolute Yuan reassured him that he would use the skills the old man had imparted to him to protect Yao Yao. In a flash of bright light, the two of them were gone. The source patterns on the ground fizzled out. The old man walked back towards his chair and fell back into it, exhausted. There was a distant rustling in from within the forest, Kang Yuan opened his eyes and collected himself. He was anticipating something. Suddenly the ground burst open, and lights shot out from deep in the forest. Debris crashed around loudly. Purple lightning showered down from massive dark clouds that had suddenly emerged out of thin air. There were three distinct beams of light and three shadowy figures at the center of each. Kang Yuan had been anticipating their arrival. He stood up, energized and excited. An intense aura exuded from him as he gathered his power and said that he had gotten rusty from all the years and that now it was finally time for him to get back in action. The man at the center of the three shadowy figures laughed and addressed Kang Yuan as Emperor He. He said that Emperor He had been hiding from them for many years like some coward and that he felt sorry for him. The man in the sky had long black hair. His eyes glowed purple and a black mark was etched onto his face. A scar extended up from his lip and he wore an imposing deep blue garb. The man demanded that Emperor He hand over Yao Yao to him and threatened to reduce him to bones if he failed to comply. The emperor responded to the man's threats by laughing at them and urging him to fight. The ground quaked and crumbled as the old man's body began to levitate off the ground, and he took flight, surrounded by red energy. He gathered energy into spheres on both of his fists and readied himself for the impending battle. Back at the mausoleum, the golden beam of light reappeared, teleporting both Zhou Yuan and Yao Yao back to the altar. Zhou Yuan called out for his father, announcing that he had returned. He noticed that he was once again feeling dizzy as an effect of the teleportation. Zhou Yao's father, who had been waiting patiently by the side of the altar, exclaimed with joy as he saw his son return. He expressed his happiness and also how worried he had been. 
Zhou Yuan proclaimed with joy that his eight meridians were available now. His father, doubtful of the claim, placed his palm on Zhou Yuan's chest to check for himself. He was amazed and overjoyed once he had confirmed that Zhou Yuan's eight meridians were truly available and said that it was a blessing from their ancestors. Zhou Yuan sensed the immense relief his father had felt from the news, and he embraced his father to comfort and reassure him. With determination, he declared that they would take back everything the Zhou family had lost. His father broke the tension by asking Zhou Yuan who the young girl was. Yao Yao stood quietly as Zhou Yuan began to explain. Zhou Yuan told Zhou Qing, his father, everything that had happened in the magical forest. Zhou Qing agreed that Zhou Yuan should follow through with Kang Yuan's request, considering all that he had imparted to Zhou Yuan. Zhou Qing ordered the Imperial Guard to head back to the Great Zhou City. Zhou Yuan and Yao Yao made their way out of the mausoleum. Yao Yao stood at the edge of a cliff and stared off into the distance with a melancholic look on her face. Tun Tun rubbed its head against her leg to comfort her as she was lost in thought. Zhou Yuan stood behind her with his eyes transfixed on her. He thought she looked quiet and tranquil and figured that she was worried about the old man. Zhou Yuan spoke and attempted to comfort her by assuring her that Kang Yuan was very powerful and would be completely fine. He added that Kang Yuan would not have wanted her to be concerned about him. Yao Yao told Zhou Yuan that she was not worried. She told him that there were people who were targeting her, and she guessed that Kang Yuan had tried to stop them, and that was why he drove them both away. Suddenly, the look on Yao Yao's face turned fierce. She vowed that if anything happened to her Grandpa Hei, she would undoubtedly avenge him, and the people responsible would not get away. Zhou Yuan was startled by the sudden shift in her temperament. He was surprised by how Yao Yao could seem so delicate and then immediately turn so intense when she got serious. At the Imperial Palace of the Great Zhou Empire, Zhou Yuan's mother hugged him tightly and sobbed profusely because she was overwhelmed with happiness upon learning that Zhou Yuan had managed to open the prophecy. Zhou Yuan's father interjected and said that Yuan could finally start training and asked her why she was crying if the news was good. She turned to him with teary eyes, annoyed and retorted, asking him if he didn't cry when he learned the good news. He laughed nervously. Zhou Yuan's mother turned her attention toward Yao Yao and asked them who this beautiful young girl was. Zhou Yuan answered that she was the one who saved him back in the forest where he had gotten the opportunity. Zhou Yuan's mother was bewitched by Yao Yao's radiant beauty. His father asked his mother to arrange accommodation for Yao Yao. She grabbed Yao Yao's hand and took her away to show her around and make all of the arrangements for her before Yuan's father could even finish what he was saying. A servant informed Zhou Yuan's father that Headmaster Chu had urgently requested an audience. Emperor Qing granted his permission, and a young man in a red uniform and short brown hair came in. Zhou Yuan tried to excuse himself, but his father stopped him from leaving and asked him to stay, and told him that as the prince of the great Zhou Empire, Yuan needed to be aware of some of the national affairs. The young man greeted Zhou Yuan and the emperor. He wore an expression of worry on his face. The man was Chu Tianyang the headmaster of the school of the Great Zhou Empire and the Alpha Academy. The emperor asked Chu Tianyang what his concern was, to which Chu Tianyang responded that his position as the headmaster of the school of the Great Zhou Empire was in danger. Chu Tianyang explained that Xu Hong chose to join Emperor Qi and was feigning his allegiance to the royal family of the Great Zhou Empire. And now, Xu Hong was trying to take over the position of headmaster. Xu Hong was the deputy headmaster at the school of the Great Zhou Empire. Chu Tianyang continued that Emperor Qi always had an interest in the school of the Great Zhou Empire and had been trying to secretly encroach on it. Emperor Qi had planted Xu Hong in the school so that Xu Hong could take over the position of headmaster. Zhou Qing asked if they were going to enact their plan now. Chu Tianyang replied that from all the information he had collected, he determined that Emperor Qi's son, Qi Yue, who also went to the great school of the Zhou Empire, was paying gifted students off with large amounts of money to switch over to Emperor Qi's side. He had drawn away more than half of the students who would have been in the top ten during the big test. Zhou Qing's concern grew. He asked if Chu Tianyang had a suggestion for dealing with this issue. The headmaster explained that after the big test, the school test would be held. The Beta Academy, which was under Xu Hong's control, had been winning the first prize in the school test for the past two years, and the students that passed the big test got inducted into the Beta Academy. According to the rule established by Emperor Zhou Qing himself, the headmaster of the academy that won the school test three consecutive times 
could run for the position of headmaster for the school of the Great Zhou Empire. Chu Tianyang suspected that if Emperor Qi came into control of the school of the Great Zhou Empire, people would start to lose confidence in the strength of the royal family and believe that they were growing weak. That would be disastrous for the royal family. Emperor Qing balled his fist, angered by the bold tactics employed by Emperor Qi. Emperor Qing remarked on Emperor Qi's ambitions and asked who the headmaster thought would win the first prize for the school test being held in half a year. Dispirited, the headmaster told the emperor that Qi Yue, Emperor Qi's son, had already opened six meridians and was the most promising competitor to win. Emperor Qing noted that both of Emperor Qi's sons were quite gifted. However, the headmaster continued and said that there was still hope for the royal family because they also had a gifted student in the school of the great Zhou Empire. Emperor Qing, curious, asked who this person was. Chu Tianyang asked him if he knew Su Yue, and the emperor joked that she was Zhou Yuan's girlfriend, which made Zhou Yuan turn red from embarrassment. Zhou Yuan tried to explain that they were just friends, and the emperor chuckled. The headmaster told them that since Su Yue had opened her third meridian, Qi Yue had been trying to recruit her over to his side as well. Zhou Yuan reassured him that Su Yue would never be drawn away, and that both Zhou Yuan and Su Yue would be opting for the Alpha Academy. Chu Tianyang was grateful and told Zhou Yuan that if he convinced Su Yue to remain with the royal family, then he would make an exception for Zhou Yuan to be admitted into the Alpha Academy too. Chu Tianyang was unaware that Zhou Yuan's eight meridians were available. Zhou Qing was convinced of Su Yue's capabilities from how highly Chu Tianyang thought of her and informed him that he would not compromise on the rules and his duties as a headmaster by admitting Zhou Yuan into the Alpha Academy because Zhou Yuan's eight meridians were now available, and he was about to begin his training. He could very well earn his position in the Academy. Chu Tianyang was surprised when he heard the unexpected news and congratulated the prince on this achievement and told him that the Alpha Academy awaited his arrival. The headmaster's concerns about the matter had been eased. He discussed some other business with the emperor for a while and left soon after. Zhou Qing stood up from his chair and stood beside Zhou Yuan, and with great excitement told him to get some rest because his training began tomorrow. Zhou Yuan acknowledged him, equally as excited. The next day at the palace, Zhou Yuan and Yao Yao sat at a table with a variety of food spread out in front of them. The foods in front of them were source food made from ingredients full of source qi that were helpful for Zhou Yuan's training. There was a bowl of nine beast soup, a first-grade source food made from the meat of nine first-grade source beasts. It was an efficient tonic. Along with the soup was a bowl of crystal rice, a second-grade source food that improved the body's condition and sped up the opening of the meridians. Zhou Yuan complimented the food, and Zhou Qing told him that his training would start right after. Zhou Yuan's mother urged Yao Yao to try the food and hoped that she'd like it. Zhou Yuan enthusiastically picked up his chopsticks and started to eat. As soon as the first bite met his mouth, he experienced a sudden strange feeling. It felt as though his body was a furnace, and a gust of red-hot qi swirled around it. Yao Yao, who was sitting beside Zhou Yuan, offered some of her food to Tun Tun on her lap. Zhou Qing started to object, but Tun Tun immediately opened his large mouth and devoured the food. He held back his objection as he saw that Tun Tun was no ordinary pet and poured himself a glass of wine. The wine caught Yao Yao's attention, and she asked if she could have some. The Empress glared at her with disapproval, and Zhou Qing, confused by her request, told her that the emerald wine was not a suitable spirit for a young girl. He saw that Yao Yao had no reaction to what he had just said, and conceded. He rang a servant to bring Yao Yao a glass of wine. She gulped down the wine eagerly. Her face lit up. She said the wine was good and reached into her sleeve. She spoke to the Empress, noting that she seemed weak and guessed that she must have suffered severe damage to her vitality at some time. She pulled out a blue flower from her sleeve and laid it on the table, offering it as payment for the wine. Zhou Qing was amazed at the sight of the flower because he had recognized it instantly as the green jade lotus seed. It was a rare source material that was capable of restoring vitality. Yao Yao smiled at them, stood up, and walked off. Zhou Yuan followed, but before he left, he urged his mother to accept the flower and told her that he would find a way to repay Yao Yao for the gift. Outside in the courtyard by the pond, Zhou Yuan sat under an arbor, meditating. He was practicing the qi attraction art because without opening a meridian first, no skills could be trained. He was drawing source qi into his body to open his meridians. As he sat in deep concentration, he thought of the technique he was about to use. 
the dragon suction art. The dragon suction art simulated the dragon's respiration in the body, breathing in the essence of the world. An exceptional capability was required to practice this art that allowed its user to inhale and exhale the source chi between the heavens and the earth by letting out a dragon's chant. Also, within the dragon suction art, a training skill was hidden, the 98 dragon forging styles. Zhou Yuan was optimistic that this way, he could finally start training the source chi. The 98 dragon forging styles hidden in the dragon suction art focused on strengthening the blood and flesh so that the body can be strong enough to simulate the dragon's breath. Zhou Yuan swished and swirled around in the courtyard, exerting himself as he went through all the forms and stances. He exclaimed loudly as he struck the final pose. Using his memory, he had gone through all 98 dragon forging styles. He stayed still, anticipating something to happen, but nothing happened. Feeling confused and embarrassed, he figured that something must have been missing. Zhou Yuan wiped the sweat off his forehead and chalked it down to him, still not being proficient enough. Determined, he readied himself to try again, pushing past the exhaustion. Zhou Yuan went through all the dragon forging styles three times, and still, nothing happened. He felt disappointed and hopeless because he had failed to attract any source chi. He began to question if the 98 dragon forging styles he was practicing were wrong. He fell to the floor, dejected and exhausted from the training. He knew that mastering the art without Kang Yuan's guidance would be very difficult. Just then, he saw Yao Yao walking by and immediately cheered up, thinking that she might be able to help. He called out to her, mentioning what a coincidence it was that she happened to pass by. Zhou Yuan asked her exuberantly if she had any advice for him. She stared at him expressionlessly, cogs turning in her head. Her expression softened and she bargained that she would give Zhou Yuan some advice, but only if he gave her five bottles of emerald wine every day. Zhou Yuan was stunned by the outrageous request and wondered if she might be developing an addiction. Zhou Yuan tried to negotiate by offering one bottle a day, rationalizing by explaining that the wine was too strong and could harm her body. She stared at him expressionlessly again, and he grew more anxious the longer she didn't talk. Finally, she huffed and turned around. She instructed Zhou Yuan to observe closely as Tun Tun leaped out of her lap. He asked her what exactly she wanted him to look at, and she told him to look at Tun Tun. Tun Tun stood on its hind legs and took a stance. Zhou Yuan watched, dumbfounded, as Tun Tun moved around and smoothly performed the entire 98 dragon forging styles. Tun Tun opened its mouth wide and inhaled. A powerful gust of wind swirled around them and got sucked into Tun Tun's mouth. Zhou Yuan's mouth dropped when he recognized the current flowing into Tun Tun to be the source chi between the heavens and the earth. Zhou Yuan was incredibly impressed to see that a creature like Tun Tun could practice a human skill. Tun Tun looked at Zhou Yuan smugly and flipped him off. Yao Yao asked Zhou Yuan if he paid attention. He answered that the demonstration was the dragon's breath and noted that the key was to keep the rhythm of the respiration so the blood and the flesh could resonate in tandem. Yao Yao was impressed at how Zhou Yuan managed to figure all that out by only looking at the demonstration once. She complimented Zhou Yuan on his powers of understanding. She had begun to understand why her grandfather, Kang Yuan, had chosen Zhou Yuan. Zhou Yuan calmed his mind and closed his eyes. In his head, he carefully recalled all the movements that he had just seen Tun Tun perform. And then he began the 98 dragon forging styles again. This time his breath was more extended and more rhythmic. His eyes glowed with intense concentration. He could sense his blood, flesh, and bones indistinctly resonating. A gush of chi swelled up along his blood and flesh. He could feel it in his throat. He let out a bellowing roar, perfectly creating the dragon's chant, and the source chi between the heavens and the earth surged towards him from the surrounding area. It converged into a white glowing line made visible to the naked eye and rushed into Zhou Yuan's body. It streamed straight toward the first meridian that was blocked in Zhou Yuan's body, and started to take effect on it. Zhou Yuan struggled from the sharp pain that surged from the source chi, colliding with the blocked meridian, but he endured it, allowing a continuous stream of source chi to hammer down on the blocked meridian. After 20 minutes, it was over. The source chi was all used up. Zhou Yuan exclaimed how amazing the dragon suction art was, noting that compared to the chi attraction art collected by his family, the dragon suction art was at least 10 times more powerful. Yao Yao, who had now taken a seat under the arbor, told Zhou Yuan that he was just at the beginning stage and that when he became more proficient, he would not even need to use the dragon suction art anymore. 
His breathing will become the dragon's chant, and he will be able to absorb the chi between the heavens and the earth anytime, anywhere. Zhou Yuan was very enthusiastic when he heard that, and said that he would immediately continue practicing the art more, but Yao Yao interfered and told him to stop, or otherwise he would kill himself. She said to him that the impact could harm his meridians, and that most people could only do it once a day. Zhou Yuan was confused, confident that his meridians could withstand more impacts. Yao Yao was astounded by what Zhou Yuan had just said, which only boosted his confidence even more. She told him that if that was the case, then he could try again, and she was even curious to see how many times he could impact his meridians. Zhou Yuan sweated profusely as he pushed himself through all of the formations of the 98 dragon forging styles once again. Yao Yao observed him keenly. He completed all the styles and successfully summoned the source Qi. He paused to meditate. A powerful energy radiated from him and he began again shortly, flowing through all of the motions perfectly. Yao Yao was transfixed, and her amazement grew as she watched Zhou Yuan when he finally sat down, exhausted and drained, having completed the 98 dragon forging styles four times over. He exclaimed that he had reached his limit. Yao Yao was awestruck by the strength of Zhou Yuan's meridians because they managed to withstand the impact of the dragon's breath four times. Zhou Yuan was exhilarated. He could sense the first blocked meridian loosening up. He was fired up and estimated that because the dragon suction art was so effective, he wouldn't need to spend months trying to open up his first meridian completely. He might only need ten days. Yao Yao thought that even Emperor Hei must have underestimated just how capable Zhou Yuan was. Zhou Yuan humbly accepted the compliment, saying that maybe a guy like him was actually quite rare. Yao Yao agreed and told him that, indeed, a person like Yuan, whose meridians were born open but closed later on, was really rare. Tun Tun smirked and flipped off Zhou Yuan again, mocking him for his misfortune. Zhou Yuan became very irritated by Tun Tun's constant arrogance. He clenched his teeth, infuriated, and decided to teach the creature a lesson and threw a stone at it. Tun Tun opened its large mouth and chomped down on the stone. Zhou Yuan remembered that Tun Tun was capable of eating stones directly. Afterwards, Tun Tun brazenly once again flipped Zhou Yuan off with contempt. Zhou Yuan came up with a clever idea. Grinning wickedly, he reached into his coat and pulled out a piece of savory dried meat. Tun Tun's eyes lit up, and it drooled at the sight of the tasty meat. Zhou Yuan waved the meat in the air and called out to Tun Tun, who came running over happily, bouncing with excitement. But just as Tun Tun had its hopes up, Zhou Yuan gobbled up the dried meat just to spite the creature. Tun Tun was shocked and upset as the savory treat was snatched away from it. Tun Tun became outraged and growled at Zhou Yuan, at which point Yao Yao cautioned Zhou Yuan from provoking the animal and said that if aggravated, it could even devour a person. She added that she had never seen anything return once it was inside Tun Tun's belly, which scared Zhou Yuan. He nervously asked her if that were to happen. Would she stop Tun Tun? To which she indifferently replied with, Ah, maybe. Zhou Yuan was terrified. Frightened, he quickly took out all the dried meat he had and gave it all to Tun Tun, hoping to appease the creature so it didn't eat him. Tun Tun, ecstatic, scoffed down the mountain of meat in front of him and celebrated his victory. Zhou Yuan recognized that Tun Tun was also a source beast and asked Yao Yao if she knew what grade it was. She said she didn't know that but told Zhou Yuan that Kang Yuan used to say that when Tun Tun grew up completely. It would be able to devour almost anything in the world. Zhou Yuan was surprised to learn that Kang Yuan thought Tun Tun was that capable. He figured that Tun Tun must have been really extraordinary. Yao Yao was walking towards a bench, and Zhou Yuan followed. He brought up what Kang Yuan had said about Yao Yao, that she was pretty good at source patterns. She questioned why he brought it up, and asked if he wanted to acquire the skills of source patterns. Zhou Yuan replied that he did, and that he had already been learning source patterns. Yao Yao sat down on the bench, exasperated that Zhou Yuan wanted to learn something yet again. She found her role as the teacher to be bothersome and told Zhou Yuan that she didn't want to do that, although she mentioned she really liked the emerald wine, hinting at Zhou Yuan that she would teach him in exchange for more wine. Zhou Yuan caught on and tried to sway her by saying that there were more wines that were better and that he could find some for her. She smiled at him gently, alluring him with her feminine charm and told him how sensible he was. Zhou Yuan was bewitched by her beauty, but soon regained himself and nervously mentioned that he could only offer one bottle of wine each day, thinking about how heavy drinking could harm her health. Yao Yao glared at him, annoyed and displeased by his response. Zhou Yuan stood stern and didn't give in, so she brushed it off and decided to help anyways. 
She told him that she assumed he had learned the source patterns and asked him what was the most critical factor of the source pattern. The soul energy, Yuan exclaimed confidently. Exactly, Yao Yao agreed. She told him that only those that possess powerful soul energy can draw the high-grade source patterns. She continued her lesson and asked him if he knew the levels of the soul energy. She continued to explain that the soul energy is divided into four realms, the void realm, the substantial realm, the perfect realm, and the roving spirit. She told him that he was born with good soul energy, but it hadn't reached the void realm yet. The soul energy was invisible and formless, and relentless practice was the only way to make it tangible. The first stage of soul energy being tangible was the void form known as the void realm. There were two methods to strengthen one's soul energy. The soul energy could either grow stronger along with a person's capability, or it could be strengthened through the cultivation of soul intensification arts. She told Zhou Yuan that the chaotic divine mill contemplation art imparted to Zhou Yuan by her grandfather, Kong Yuan, was a top-tier soul intensification art. She sadly informed Zhou Yuan that his soul energy currently was not strong enough to draw a first-grade source pattern. She suggested that he practice the chaotic divine mill contemplation art as soon as possible, and when his soul energy reached the void realm, then she would show him how to draw a first-grade soul pattern. Zhou Yuan was impatiently waiting to try the chaotic divine mill contemplation art and thought that it was great that Yao Yao was around and he could just ask her about anything he didn't understand. Zhou Yuan sat down on the ground and told Yao Yao that he would practice it now. He assumed a meditation position and activated his soul energy to sense the mark left by Kang Yuan in his mind. He then began to practice the chaotic divine mill contemplation art. He closed his eyes and searched inside, and in the dark vastness of his mind, he saw an unfathomable, dazzling light in the distance. He felt as though something terrible was hiding there. As he went closer to the light, he felt a strong force pulling him into it. He felt as though his soul was about to be sucked in. Zhou Yuan experienced dizziness for an instant and noticed that the thongs around him started to change. He was transported to a different world full of spectacular sights, where his soul floated over a vast ocean that plunged into a gaping chasm. Inexplicable structures hovered overhead in a sky that was blocked by massive dark clouds. He guessed that this was the chaotic space in the chaotic divine mill contemplation art. The chaos in that place devoured time and space and made it look like a world before the existence of heaven and earth. All the matter continuously fed into a single structure, the mill. Zhou Yuan saw that everything in the void was devoured by the mill. The sight sent shivers down his spine. The mottled gigantic mill was full of fragments of time itself, and the black masses that dropped into it appeared to be the blood of deities and demons. The mill rotated slowly, crushing everything in its wake. Suddenly mystical instructions manifested in his mind and told him. The divine mill was created in chaos, and its rotation could crush deities and devils. The contemplation of the divine mill would use the soul as a primer that would be crushed by the mill. Zhou Yuan figured that those instructions that appeared abruptly must be the instructions for chaotic divine mill contemplation art. The instruction continued and told Yuan that the divine mill would rotate nine times. Each rotation stood for one level of heaven. Zhou Yuan trembled at the terrifying sight of the mill and recalled what Yao Yao had said. She had told him that great fear had been overcome during the practice of the art. One needed incredible courage to perform the daunting task of jumping into the mill and being crushed by it. Zhou Yuan was hysterical when he realized that even if he didn't do it himself, the suction force of the mill was so strong that his soul would be sucked into it regardless. Zhou Yuan mustered his resolve, throwing caution to the wind. He thought he couldn't possibly know the feel if he didn't try it. He recklessly charged straight into the mill, his soul welled up with intense, sharp pain as he fell into the divine mill. Zhou Yuan began to breathe heavy as he endured the pain of his soul being crushed in the divine mill until finally, it was over. His soul had completely disappeared. And then, just as fast, his soul had respawned once again outside of the mill. Zhou Yuan's heart was still racing, and he thought about how insane it all was and that any other person with poor psychological endurance would have been paralyzed by the fear. This soul intensification art was truly terrifying, he thought. The mill had two layers, like two wheels grinding against each other. On the outside of the cylindrical wheels were golden vertical lines equally spaced apart like divisions on a scale. 
The upper wheel would move as the mill rotated, and the golden line on the upper and lower half would align to signify the completion of one rotation. Zhou Yuan had entered the mill, and his body had been crushed immediately, and he realized that it was not a simple task to complete one entire rotation. He grinned. Despite trembling from the fear, he was also excited because he could feel the effects of the soul intensification. After just one attempt, he could sense that his soul's energy had been intensified. He now understood why Yao Yao considered this to be a top-tier soul intensification art. His eyes lit up with determination, and he was ready to tackle the challenge again. He motivated himself by telling himself that there was no free lunch. He shouted again and darted straight back into the mill. Once again, his soul was crushed in an instant, but his resolve never wavered, and he jumped back into the mill over and over again after respawning every time. After being repeatedly crushed so many times, his soul had reforged. His spiritual form lost its formlessness and coalesced into a translucent figure. His soul had changed to the void form from its formless stage, and his soul energy had reached the void realm. Back at the temple courtyard, Zhou Yuan broke out of his meditative state, exhausted and panting hard. Yao Yao asked him how it felt, and he happily reported that he had reached the void realm. Her eyes were wide from surprise. She was in disbelief and asked him how many times he got crushed for him to reach the void realm this fast. Zhou Yuan fell back, tired, and laid on his back on the ground. He answered Yao Yao and told her that he had been crushed 88 times. He added that he felt like he had used up all his energy. She stared at him in awe. She was amazed since ordinary people could endure being crushed by the mill about 10 times when they first practiced the chaotic divine mill contemplation art. But Zhou Yuan managed to finish 88 times on his first attempt. Yao Yao thought that Zhou Yuan truly was extraordinary and understood why he was the one that used to have the sacred dragon's kismet. She smiled and told Zhou Yuan that compared to his broken eight meridians, his soul energy was still intact. She turned away from Zhou Yuan and said that after all his exertion, his soul energy was too weak now and said that when he recovered, she would teach him the first grade source pattern. Zhou Yuan was thrilled and thanked her. As she walked off, she reminded Yuan he shouldn't forget to nourish the heaven element one that Kang Yuan had left him, and he should light up the first source pattern as soon as possible. Zhou Yuan agreed. He also wished to find out how this small pen, shorter than 40 centimeters, could transform into a source weapon. Outside the palace, Zhou Yuan was training relentlessly when he was approached by a servant with a tray who interrupted his training and told him that the things he had requested had arrived. In her tray, the servant had an assortment of light amber-colored crystals. Zhou Yuan took one of the rocks and lifted it up to the sun. The light passed through the translucent crystal, revealing a small dragon-like shape stuck within the rock. It was a beast soul crystal formed after the death of a source beast. The crystals were first grade beast soul crystals, and Zhou Yuan worried whether the heaven element pen would even be able to absorb the crystals because their grade was too high compared to the pen. Regardless, Zhou Yuan was glad the crystals had arrived, and he eagerly pulled out a hammer and a chisel and began chipping away at the crystals. As soon as a small crack developed, Zhou Yuan brought out the heaven element pen and brought it near the crack. Wisps of light floated out of the crack, and Zhou Yuan watched with reverence as one of the source patterns flickered and started to glow slightly. Zhou Yuan was ecstatic that it was working, and he continued. He chipped away at the stones till the heaven element pen became unresponsive after absorbing eight beast soul crystals. The pen even changed appearance and began to look more tarnished. Zhou Yuan was irritated that the pen had stopped absorbing the crystals and poked at the pen, questioning if this meant that the pen was full. Eventually, he calmed himself and decided to be patient and give it more time. He decided to go find Su Yue. He searched for her around the school of the Great Zhou Empire, but couldn't find her anywhere. After asking around, he was told that Su Yue had started working at the library again. Zhou Yuan went into the library looking for Su Yue. He turned around a corner while calling out to her and paused as soon as his eyes found her. The first thing he saw was her bare legs, and he froze. She was up on a stool and singing to herself as she arranged the books on the shelves. Zhou Yuan was enchanted by the sight of her. He couldn't help but stare. Su Yue noticed Zhou Yuan staring at her from below. She happened to be wearing a skirt, and she was very embarrassed. She chucked a book at him, which hit him right in his eye, and he screamed in pain. He cried out that he was blind, and she simply scoffed at him. Su Yue glared at Zhou Yuan in disgust, clutching her skirt and holding it down. She accused Zhou Yuan of being a pervert because she thought he was staring up her skirt. 
Zhou Yuan covered his eyes as she quickly jumped down from the stool. He apologized and said that it was an accident, and promised that he saw nothing. Su Yue tucked her hair behind her ear, acting indifferent. She asked Zhou Yuan what he was doing there, considering he was so busy. He joked that he worried Su Yue may get abducted by someone. She was annoyed by the answer, and he laughed playfully. Su Yue told Zhou Yuan that she suspected that he had come to meet her because he must have heard what Qi Yue was up to. She confirmed that Qi Yue had been very clingy with her recently, and she was bothered by it. Zhou Yuan asked Su Yue if Qi Yue had asked her to join the Beta Academy. She answered yes. He delved deeper, asking her what Qi Yue offered her, and told Zhou Yuan that he offered her a third-grade art of Source Qi, and that she refused him. Zhou Yuan was relieved and said that Qi Yue must have been really upset about being rejected like that. Su Yue told Zhou Yuan that Qi Yue also asked what Zhou Yuan offered her, and she had told him about the time when Zhou Yuan helped her out in the rain all that time ago. Zhou Yuan was taken aback by this. She giggled at him, teased him for looking so dumbfounded, and walked off. Zhou Yuan smiled, reassured that Su Yue would never betray him. He watched her as she walked away and reminded himself that although he trusted her, he couldn't rely on this alone. Yuan walked along with Su Yue through the library and told her how Headmaster Chu had requested him to convince Su Yue to join the Alpha Academy. She reassured him that if he was joining the Alpha Academy, then she would too. As they walked down a lane, a stranger called out to Prince Yuan. It was a tall man with long black hair and green eyes. His hands were together in a greeting. He turned his attention to Su Yue, asking if her business at the library was finished, and if she had time, then he would like to invite her to dinner. Zhou Yuan was alert. He recognized the man as Lin Feng, the most promising candidate in the school who seemingly had been drawn over to Qi Yue's side. As Lin Feng stood in front of them with a tranquil expression, Zhou Yuan wondered what a man as formidable as he was doing there. Su Yue replied to Lin Feng and nervously told him she did not have time to have dinner with him. Lin Feng understood, said that he hoped to have dinner together next, and apologized for disturbing them both. Zhou Yuan nodded in acknowledgement, and Lin Feng left. Lin Feng was disgruntled by Su Yue's rejection of his advance. A man laughed at him from the passageway between the bookshelves and told him that he had a very slim chance with Su Yue. It was Qi Yue, hidden between the shelves. He had observed the encounter. Lin Feng greeted him. Qi Yue explained to Lin Feng that despite Zhou Yuan's unfortunate situation, he was still the prince of the country and had helped Su Yue in the past, and therefore Su Yue was quite devoted to Zhou Yuan. Lin Feng told him that he knew that, yet he still seemed very bothered to hear it from Qi Yue. Qi Yue saw how upset he was and teasingly asked him if he seriously liked Su Yue. Lin Feng explained to him that despite being just a common girl, Su Yue could change everything, and her exceptional potential was sure to get noticed in the future. Qi Yue agreed and said it was only a matter of time before her rise. He attributed it to Zhou Yuan's kismet that he managed to find a talent like her so easily. Lin Feng told Qi Yue that this was the reason behind his determination. Qi Yue tried to cheer up Lin Feng by praising him and telling him the only superiority Zhou Yuan had over him was due to his title as the prince, without which he would be no match for Lin Feng. Lin Feng concurred that if Zhou Yuan wasn't the prince of the great Zhou Empire, he'd be a waste who couldn't even open his meridians and train. He leaned in close to Lin Feng and whispered in his ear, informing Lin Feng that when he asked Su Yue to join the Beta Academy, she had refused him too. He smiled mischievously as he said this. His manipulation was underway. He implied that the only reason she would have refused him was because she had feelings for Zhou Yuan. Hearing this hurt Lin Feng who was disillusioned, but Qi Yue just as quickly planted an idea in his head. He proposed that if Su Yu Wei saw Zhou Yuan suffer a crushing defeat in the big test, she would lose her confidence in him. Qi Yue even offered to arrange a match between Lin Feng and Zhou Yuan during the big match. Lin Feng was already convinced, but Qi Yue added that he didn't need to worry about any negative repercussions, and assured him that since his family had sided with Emperor Qi, they would provide his family with refuge should anything unexpected happen. Lin Feng was energized and adamant about delivering Zhou Yuan a humiliating defeat. He was appalled that someone as useless as Zhou Yuan dared to steal Su Yue from him. Lin Feng promptly excused himself to go resume his training, leaving Qi Yue laughing, pleased with how well his trickery had worked. He plotted that when Zhou Yuan lost in the big test, he would approach Su Yue once more and ask her to join the Beta Academy, hoping that she was smart enough to differentiate between winners and losers. 
He thought that with Su Yue joining the Beta Academy, there would be no one standing in his way, and the school of the Great Zhou Empire would fall into the hands of Emperor Qi. Then all the graduates of the school would bear the mark of Emperor Qi. He dreamed that at that time, the Great Empire might also be overturned. Outside the library, Zhou Yuan and Su Yue walked together next to the pond. Zhou Yuan shared with Su Yue that he thought Lin Feng was colluding with Qi Yue, informing her that it could have been a plot by Qi Yue. Zhou Yuan joked that since Qi Yue failed to draw Su Yue over to his side, he sent a handsome boy to lure her instead. She told Zhou Yuan that he was annoying and that she was immune to handsome boys. Zhou Yuan told her to calm down and that he was just joking. Su Yue expressed her concern to Zhou Yan about how most freshmen had been drawn over to the other side. She worried that they were scheming to play dirty tricks on Zhou Yuan during the big test. Zhou Yuan told her not to worry and that he'd be fully prepared by then. Secretly, Zhou Yuan was a little concerned because the bribes offered by Emperor Qi's family were very tempting. They were almost as wealthy as the royal family. He thought that his father's suspicions were correct, and Emperor Qi's family was backed by the Great Wu Empire. By controlling the school of the Great Zhou Empire, they would strike a fatal blow to the royal family. Zhou Yuan was determined not to let that happen. For the next few days, Zhou Yuan remained in the imperial place, using all his time practicing diligently. Early in the morning, he would practice the 98 dragon forging styles to impact his meridians four times. Then in the evening, he would strengthen his soul energy by practicing the chaotic divine mill contemplation art. He continued to find beast soul crystals for the heaven element pen to absorb. Ultimately, he managed to completely unlock the first source pattern on the heaven element pen. He was ecstatic when the first antique source pattern on the heaven element pen lit up completely and glowed with a radiant, mysterious light. As soon as the first source pattern lit up, some information formed in his mind. The message revealed to Zhou Yuan was brain and brawn. Brain and brawn Zhou Yuan recognized it as a source pattern that provided the pen with two states. He now understood how the source pen could also be a source weapon. He decided to give it a try by changing the pen to the brawn state. Instantly, the tiny pen transformed into an enormous version of itself. Zhou Yuan was exhilarated to see the transformation and amazed by how heavy it had become. The source weapons were capable of absorbing the source qi between the heavens and earth and turning it into destructive energy. Zhou Yuan drew the source qi into the weapon, and as it rushed in, the heaven element pen started to glow. The source qi converged at the pen's tip, transforming it into a sharp spearhead. Zhou Yuan excitedly tested the weapon. He jabbed at the air multiple times and then swung the weapon around. He noted that while its attacks were fierce, the weapon was quite heavy. Zhou Yuan spotted an empty cart he could use to test the weapon on and plunged the spear straight through the target with ease. He was amazed at how sharp the spear was and how it had reached the level of an intermediate source weapon. Zhou Yuan figured that he should learn some spear arts in the future. Zhou Yuan converted the heaven element pen back to its brain state and admired the brain and brawn source pattern as he held it in his hand. He figured the grade of the source pattern must have been very high. He marveled at the thought that he had only lit up one source pattern on the pen, and the change had been that drastic. He couldn't imagine how powerful the pen would be if all nine source patterns were fully lit. Yao Yao's voice interrupted his pondering. She asked him if he had activated the first source pattern. He informed her that he had just activated the first pattern and was just about to go find her. He told her that he had reached the Void Realm and asked when she would start to teach him the source pattern she had promised earlier. She didn't say anything and simply held out her hand. Zhou Yuan understood that she was demanding her payment first. He sheepishly handed her a bottle of the Crimson Tiger wine. He advised her that it was quite strong and told her that he had stolen it from his father. She chugged it back immediately and thanked him for not delaying it. Zhou Yuan sighed with resignation. He looked down and found, to his shock, that Tun Tun was also reaching out its claws, expecting a treat from Zhou Yuan. He thought to himself that the pet was just as greedy as its owner. He reluctantly laid down a plate of dried meat for Tun Tun. It devoured it hungrily. Yao Yao sat down at a table under an arbor and explained to Zhou Yuan that she was going to teach him a first-grade source pattern. She began her demonstration and told Zhou Yuan to pay attention. A green jade block was in front of her on the table. She held out her hand. Pink wisps of light came out of her palm and magically manifested into a source pen. Zhou Yuan was transfixed on her. He thought she looked majestic when she held her source pen and that the source pen itself was quite extraordinary.
With absolute concentration, she began to glide her pen over the slab on the table and drew a pattern. She lifted her pen to reveal the tiger's roar pattern. She said that it was a first-grade source pattern that had to be drawn on the throat. When activated, it would attack with the sound wave of a tiger's roar. If activated at short distances, it could also be used to control their enemies. Zhou Yuan was fascinated. He knew that a sound wave source pattern like that one was quite rare, and it could turn the tide of combat at a critical time. Yao Yao asked Zhou Yuan to pay attention and asked him how many source strokes were in the pattern. He focused hard on the pattern drawn in front and counted each stroke. He answered that he had found 437 source strokes in the design. Yao Yao corrected him and told him that there were altogether 448 strokes in the pattern. She commended him, saying that he had laid a pretty good foundation in source patterns. As she walked off, Yao Yao instructed Zhou Yuan to copy the tiger's roar pattern and master it completely. Zhou Yuan was determined to do his best to enter the Alpha Academy by getting into the top 10 in the big test. That was the only way the Zhou family could gain control over Emperor Qi's forces. Along with the Source Qi and Source Pattern, Zhou Yuan also began practicing some spear arts to be better equipped to handle the Heaven Element pen. Due to all the rigorous training, Zhou Yuan was now confident that he had reached the most crucial stage in his cultivation. It was finally time for him to open in his first meridian. He was thrilled. He took a deep breath to ready himself and then started. He flowed through all of the 98 dragon forging styles effortlessly. The source qi between the heavens and the earth manifested around him and streamed towards him. It converged and rushed in through his mouth and flowed through him and impacted the last remaining barrier to his first meridian, crushing it. An enormous surge of energy radiated from within him, and Zhou Yuan knew that the first meridian had been opened. He felt a raging fire ignite in his chest, and energy flowed through every limb. He exhaled heavily. He was amazed by the feeling of opening a meridian, and set out to inform his parent of what he had accomplished. In the palace, Zhou Yuan's father was astonished when he heard the news. Just as he had expected, Zhou Yuan opened his first meridian within just ten days. In the Zhou Empire, Nobody had ever opened their first meridian in that short time span. It became clear to him why Zhou Yuan had the fate of the Zhou family's sacred dragon. Zhou Yuan's mother exclaimed with joy and hugged him tightly. She said that if Zhou Yuan continued his training, he'd be able to suppress the rancorous dragon's poison after three years. Zhou Yuan asked his mother to put her heart at ease and that he would definitely get rid of the poison. When he had finished talking to his mother, Emperor Qing called out to Zhou Yuan. He was poised as he asked Zhou Yuan, since he had opened his first meridian if he was strong enough to have a sparring contest with his father. Zhou Yuan could, since his father's imposing prowess, even though he hadn't done anything except simply stand there. He was an expert who had stepped into the primordial realm. Zhou Yuan obliged and boldly accepted the challenge. They faced off in the courtyard. Zhou Yuan, without hesitation, lunged straight at Emperor Qing. Open meridian, qi cultivation, heaven gate and primordial, were the first four greater realms of the Source Master. Zhou Yuan knew that he had only just opened his first meridian, but he refused to be intimidated by his father's strength. He attacked with all his might. Zhou Yuan threw a punch, which his father caught midair without even flinching. Zhou was startled by how powerful his father was. He couldn't break past his hand. Emperor Qing summoned small burning stones in his hand and shot them at Zhou Yuan. Zhou Yuan struggled as he dodged the multiple fireballs that flew toward him. One of the stones came straight at Zhou Yuan's head. He reflexively caught the projectile in his bare hand. Emperor Qing was taken aback. The emperor shot a lightning bolt at Zhou Yuan, and Zhou Yuan panicked, realizing that he wasn't fast enough to dodge the attack. The lightning bolt struck Zhou Yuan, sending him flying backward. His mother, worried, came running over to him. She asked him if he was okay, and he replied that he was. She turned her attention to Emperor Qing and scolded him for being too reckless and hurting Zhou Yuan. She asked him why he used the scorching Thunder Qi, and he apologetically responded that he had used it unintentionally. The Emperor commended Zhou Yuan and told him that despite only having opened one meridian, his strength speed and strike speed were even better than someone who had opened two meridians. Zhou Yuan recalled what Kang Yuan had told him about his meridians. He had told him that he would receive more benefits when he opened his meridians than an ordinary person, and Zhou Yuan could see now that it was true. Emperor Qing told him that he had done well, and expressed how happy he was that the Emperor of the Great Wu Empire's plans to trap the sacred dragon of the Zhou family had not been successful. He was hopeful that the Great Zhou Empire could rise again, 
Zhou Yuan was elated, and his mother embraced him tightly. Emperor Qing had told Yuan that since his first meridian was open, he could begin acquiring source skills and arranged for Zhou Yuan to be provided with source skills suitable for his cultivation. Similar to source weapons, source skills were also categorized into different levels. Ordinary, Dark, Heaven, and Sacred. People who had recently opened a meridian could only acquire ordinary source skills. Zhou Yuan flipped through a blue book containing different source skills. He read out names such as Hun Yuan Palm and Space Smashing Tong Ming Fist and tried to decide which one he should acquire first. Suddenly, he was startled by a voice behind him. It was Yao Yao. She was standing behind him and was reading over his shoulder. She criticized the source skills for being mediocre. Yuan turned around to face her, and she told him that he was talented and asked why he was wasting his time on such mediocre skills. Zhou Yuan was confused, and she mocked him for being slow-witted. Yao Yao questioned if he had sensed anything while practicing the 98 dragon forging styles all this time. He was still confused. Upon Yao Yao's instructions, Zhou Yuan found a clearing in the courtyard and began practicing the 98 dragon forging styles once again. This time he paid close attention and tried to sense something. He breezed through all of the motion and started to feel something. He cried out in surprise as the realization struck him. There were more source skills hidden within the 98 dragon forging styles. Yao Yao teased that maybe he was not that stupid after all, and confirmed that there were two source skills hidden in the 98 dragon forging styles. Zhou Yuan was shocked to learn that there were two source skills hidden in the dragon forging styles. Yao Yao told him that he was right. The two source skills were the dragon's pace and the dragon's tablet palm. Zhou Yuan immediately started buddying up to her and asked her for more guidance. She held out her hand, signaling Wen to give her a bottle of wine. Zhou Yuan chuckled cheekily and told her that he had expected her demand and already made preparations for it. He snapped his fingers and called out to the servant to bring him the wine. A servant brought him a tray with a bottle of wine on it, which he humbly presented to Yao Yao. She was happy and ready to teach Yuan. She dropped Tun Tun from her arms and told him to perform the skill. Zhou Yuan was dumbfounded and wide-eyed that Tun Tun, who, amazingly enough already, had known the 98 dragon forging styles, also knew these skills as well. Yao Yao told him that whenever Kang Yuan had time, he would spend it teaching Tun Tun some source skills. She said that technically, it was Tun Tun who would be teaching Zhou Yuan. Zhou Yuan was distraught. He contemplated whether Tun Tun was just a guy wearing an animal's skin. He couldn't believe that Tun Tun could acquire source skills like that. He meekly went to Tun Tun and asked it to demonstrate the dragon's pace and the dragon tablet palm for him. Tun Tun dismissively brushed him off, implying that he wasn't worth Tun Tun's time. Zhou Yuan was irritated by Tun Tun ignoring him, and he came up with an idea to appease Tun Tun. He brought out a plate full of savory dried meat, which caught Tun Tun's attention immediately. Tun Tun pounced on the plate, but Zhou Yuan pulled it back and said that it could have the meat if it showed him the skills first. Unwillingly, Tun Tun demonstrated the dragon's pace for Zhou Yuan. Yao Yao explained that the dragons that hid in the clouds were barely discernible, and similarly, the dragon's pace was also abstract and unpredictable. As Tun Tun performed the skill, his body started to blur. Yao Yao ordered Zhou Yuan to try and attack Tun Tun. Zhou Yuan brought out the heaven element pen and changed it to its bronze state. He went in for the attack. He jabbed straight at Tun Tun but somehow missed. He was perplexed and thought his eyes were playing tricks on him. He attacked again and threw multiple jabs with the spear and missed every time. He was in disbelief, and he couldn't understand how he was missing. Tun Tun stood and taunted Zhou Yuan while boasting of his victory. Yao Yao explained that by acquiring the dragon's pace, the source Qi in the body created an illusion by resonating with the air. The illusions formed through this skill were three inched away from the user's body, and this gap was the subtlety of the dragon's pace. She announced that Tun Tun would demonstrate the dragon tablet palm next. Tun Tun started to wave its arms around wildly, going through the motions of the skill. Zhou Yuan watched intently. He raised his hand with a loud, crackling sound. Tun Tun extended its arm, and the ground exploded with immense power in the direction its palm was facing. Zhou Yuan was awestruck by how destructive the palm technique was, and even more amazed by how little source Chi Tun Tun had expended. After the demonstration, Tun Tun enjoyed its reward and excitedly scarfed down the plate of dried meat. Afterward, Zhou Yuan took a moment to ponder, carefully contemplating the profound nature of the dragon's pace and the dragon's tablet palm. When he was confident that he had a better understanding of the technique, he began, flowing through the motions seamlessly. 
Yao Yao was pleasantly surprised when she registered that Zhou Yuan had ascertained some clues about the skill by simply watching it once. Within the span of 30 minutes, Zhou Yuan had gotten more proficient in the skill, and his movements mimicked that of a flying dragon. His body became blurred and illusory. He had successfully performed the dragon pace and was almost frightened by how well it had worked, making it difficult to distinguish the real body and the illusions. He readies himself once more to attempt the dragon tablet palm. He focused intently and performed the hand motions till he could feel the energy accumulating in his palm. He shot it out at a nearby tree and the force from his palm blew a hole through the trunk of the tree. Zhou Yuan was out of breath, panting but ultimately glad, realizing that with the help of the dragon's pace and the dragon tablet palm, his fighting capacity would be considerably enhanced. He was optimistic that if he managed to open his second meridian, he could easily pass the big test. Tun Tun taunted that he was just too young, and Zhou Yuan was irked because he was right. As more days went by, the day of the big test approached closer. During this period, Zhou Yuan did not take any breaks and tirelessly trained every day. During the day, he would practice the 98 dragon forging styles and tried to open his second meridian. In the evening, he practiced the chaotic divine mill contemplation art to strengthen his soul energy. Zhou Yuan started to feel the benefits of the chaotic divine mill contemplation art when he noticed that no matter how exhausted he got by training during the day, he would be completely rejuvenated after one night of contemplation. Zhou Yuan also used any opportunity he could get to learn source patterns from Yao Yao. He also diligently practiced his new skills, the dragon's pace, and the dragon tablet palm. Although this relentless training was arduous and challenging, Zhou Yuan was eventually rewarded for his persistence. Two days before the big test, he had successfully opened the second meridian. He was absolutely ecstatic, and his parents were pleased by his accomplishment. Zhou Yuan practiced the dragon tablet palmed on a massive rock. The rock cracked apart and exploded into several pieces. Zhou Yuan knew that there were three levels to the dragon tablet palm. Crush mountains, crack ground, and break heaven. Using the strength acquired by opening his second meridian, Zhou Yuan could use crush mountains. It was the day before the big test. Zhou Yuan was aiming to enter the top ten so that the burden of representing the royal family would not be solely on Su Yu Wei. He also worried that she would not be strong enough to restrain Qi Yue on her own. He knew that Emperor Qi had cast his greedy eyes on the school of the great Zhou Empire and was counting on Qi Yue. Once he took control of the school, he would convert it into the school of the Qi Empire, and that would be a crushing defeat for the Zhou family. Zhou Yuan was adamant that the Qi family did not succeed in their plan, and he planned on trying his best to stop them. Finally, the day of the big test arrived. A large swarm of people was assembled in the central courtyard of the school of the great Zhou Empire. They gathered around four separate arenas. Zhou Yuan was daunted by the size of the crowd until he spotted a familiar figure amongst the masses. It was Su Yue. Zhou Yuan called out to her and she turned around and saw him. She was excited when she spotted Zhou Yuan and buoyantly called out to him. The bystanders who witnessed her jumping excitedly to meet Zhou Yuan felt envious of him and stared at him with disdain. Zhou Yuan was embarrassed and thought that this might stir some trouble. Su Yue was glad to see Zhou Yuan, who asked her about her progress, confirming if it was true that she had opened four meridians. She told him that she had opened them a while ago. Su Yue, concerned about Zhou Yuan, asked him about his preparations for the test. He confidently reassured her that he would definitely enter the top ten in the big test. Su Yue nodded, trusting him completely. The pair conversed for a while, unaware that they were being watched. Qi Yue had been observing them from a balcony on a building nearby. Qi Yue remarked that he hadn't thought that Prince Yuan would actually show up for the big test. Alongside Qi Yue were Lin Feng and Liu Shi. Liu Shi scoffed and said that Zhou Yuan was being overconfident in his abilities and that his measly source pattern skills would never result in him being a powerful expert. Lin Feng noticed how happy Su Yue was next to Zhou Yuan, and the sight of those two together infuriated him. He clenched his teeth together and scowled. Qi Yue threw his arm around Lin Feng's shoulder and smiled as he assured him that everything was taken care of. He smirked and told him that he had prepared a gift for the prince, saying that since Zhou Yuan had the nerve to show up to the big test, he would face a defeat so humiliating that he would be too ashamed to step into the school of the great Zhou Empire again. He ominously proclaimed that the big test would have a great spectacle as Zhou Yuan walked towards the arena. 
The announcer bellowed across the assembly, instructing that a lot would determine the combatants for the big test. Every participant was to take a number. People with similar numbers would be each other's opponents. Someone laughed on a balcony that looked over the entire courtyard. It was Xu Hong, the headmaster of the Beta Academy, and with him was headmaster Chu Tianyang. Xu Hong commented that the big test this time around was hilarious. He knowingly taunted Headmaster Chu and said that the top 10 students from this test would not be joining the Alpha Academy. Headmaster Chu was disgruntled, knowing that almost all the most promising students had been swayed over to Emperor Chi's side. He cautioned Headmaster Chu from being too presumptuous. Headmaster Chu laughed off his warnings and sneered, threatening that Headmaster Chu may not remain a headmaster for long. Headmaster Chu felt disillusioned by the state of things, he knew that he could not match the incentives that the emperor had used to lure the students. His only hope was that Su Yue would perform well enough in the big test that she'd be capable enough to compete with Chi Yue when the school test came about at the end of the year. Headmaster Chu did not have much hope for Zhou Yuan, as he knew Zhou Yuan had only opened one meridian. He could only be optimistic that Zhou Yuan won several battles, but did not expect him to enter the top ten. Down on the field, Zhou Yuan and Su Yue drew their lots. Zhou Yuan got 18, while Su Yue got 47. Zhou Yuan remarked that it was good that they didn't draw the same numbers, to which Su Yue nonchalantly responded that if they had, she would not have gone easy on Zhou Yuan. He laughed nervously, unsure if she was being serious. The announcer's voice boomed once again, calling out to the contestants that had the number one to enter the arena and start their battle. Su Yue noted that since Zhou Yuan's number was smaller than hers, he would be going before her. She teased, asking him if that made him nervous. Zhou Yuan maintained his composure and told her to just enjoy the contests. The crowd erupted in cheers as the battles began. Combatants competed fiercely. The winners rejoiced while the losers left in dismay. Soon enough, it was Zhou Yuan's turn. The announcer called out Zhou Yuan's name along with his opponent Pei Yun, urging the two to enter the arena and prepare for their battle. Zhou Yuan became uneasy as he recognized the name of his opponent. Su Yue commented that Pei Yun was the best among those who had opened three meridians. Zhou Yuan remembered that Pei Yun was infamous for his strength among the freshmen. He felt it was too much of a coincidence that he'd encounter someone as strong as Pei Yun this early in the contest. Chattering broke out in the crowd. People were concerned about the unfortunate matchup and speculated that Zhou Yuan might get eliminated in the first round. Zhou Yuan could since something felt wrong. He looked around until he spotted Qi Yue up on a balcony smiling back at him sardonically. His hand folded at Zhou Yuan as though he was acknowledging him. Zhou Yuan was immediately suspicious that this matchup was an arrangement made by Qi Yue. This plot signified the extent of Emperor Qi's infiltration into the school, and what surprised Zhou Yuan the most was that Emperor Qi would put his best students on the line just to cause trouble for him. Su Yue was worried about Zhou Yuan. He reassured her and confidently stated that it won't be easy for someone who had just opened three meridians to stop him. Chi Yue watched on from above with malice, delighting at the thought of Zhou Yuan's defeat as Zhou Yuan entered the arena. Zhou Yuan faced off with Pei Yun, who greeted him by saying that he hoped Zhou Yuan didn't lose too soon so that the crowd could enjoy the fight. Zhou Yuan asked him if this was indeed a setup by Chi Yue. Pei Yun feigned ignorance and claimed he was just as surprised. Pei Yun asked Zhou Yuan not to blame him because he did not intend to show him mercy. Zhou Yuan jabbed back by saying that someone as callous as Pei Yun could not have a good end. The announcer declared the start of the contest, and Pei Yun instantaneously charged at Zhou Yuan, mocking him all the while by saying that Zhou Yuan should try to avoid embarrassing himself. Zhou Yuan stood calmly as Pei Yun's fist darted in his direction. He raised his hand, getting ready to block the attack. The crowd was shocked and confused as they thought Pei Yun's attack would surely break Zhou Yuan's arm. Pei Yun was irritated by Zhou Yuan's confidence and forced his fist into his palm. It connected with a loud boom, and his face immediately fell into an expression of horror as he realized that Zhou Yuan hadn't even budged. He was stunned by how easily Zhou Yuan had stopped his attack and couldn't understand how that was possible. Having had enough, Zhou Yuan squeezed Pei Yun's fist till he fell to his knees from the pain. The onlookers were dumbfounded and Pei Yun was amazed by Zhou Yuan's sudden strength, but he wasn't done yet. He opened his three meridians saying that Zhou Yuan was underestimating him and that he would teach him a lesson as soon as he got from his grip. He looked up to meet Zhou Yuan's eyes and immediately felt a sense of dread when he saw the look of vicious intensity on Zhou Yuan's face. 
Zhou Yuan told him to go away, and before Pei Yun could understand what he meant, a foot connected with his face with immense force, knocking him out and sending him hurling through the air all the way outside the arena. Zhou Yuan turned around and started walking away before Pei Yun's body even touched the ground. The crowd was stupefied with their eyes wide, marveling at the power behind Zhou Yuan's kick. The spectators were confused and chattered amongst themselves, asking how Zhou Yuan got so strong when he couldn't even open his meridians to perform cultivation. Exasperated, Qi Yue looked on from above, witnessing the events that had taken place. He grew more concerned, realizing that the kick that finished off Pei Yun was from Zhou Yuan's own physical strength completely. Pei Yun could easily win against others who had opened three meridians, yet somehow Zhou Yuan, with no meridians opened, had defeated him. Su Yue also watched with amazement. She figured that Zhou Yuan had been hiding his true strength. Lin Feng was in disbelief and asked how it was possible. Qi Yue exclaimed that they had been fooled, and Lin Feng noted that Zhou Yuan had used Source Qi to reinforce his kick, which meant that he had opened his meridians. Qi Yue was still persistent, and thought that Pei Yun had simply been taken by surprise, and figured that if he had known that Zhou Yuan had opened his meridians, he would have won easily. Qi Yue thought that Zhou Yuan was very cunning in using this tactic, but sure that it would only work once. Up on their balcony, the two headmasters were amazed by what they had seen. Headmaster Chu wondered how Zhou Yuan was suddenly so strong. He knew that Zhou Yuan had opened his first meridian about a month ago, but that still couldn't explain his kick, just now that had been almost as powerful as that of an expert who had opened three meridians. Headmaster Shu was no longer as cheerful as before. Back in the courtyard, Su Yue met with Zhou Yuan after his fight. She was upset that Zhou Yuan had hidden his true strength from her and asked him to be honest about how many meridians he had opened. He responded nervously that he had opened two meridians. Su Yue remarked that his kick had seemed more powerful than that. Zhou Yuan tried to explain that the reason was a little complicated, but Su Yue just interpreted it as Zhou Yuan trying to keep his secrets. She felt offended by this and said that if he didn't want to tell her, then he didn't have to. She continued that since he had opened two meridians, then it might really be possible for him to enter the top ten. As the big test proceeded, soon it was Su Yue's turn. Her opponent was a guy who had just opened two meridians. He was terrified when he learned he was going up against Su Yue. Su Yue swiftly defeated her opponent, and after several more contests, it was Zhou Yuan's turn once again. The announcer's voice told him that his opponent for the match was a man named Shi Yu. The crowd arose with murmurings. The spectators were keen to pay more attention this round, since Zhou Yuan's previous fight had ended too quickly. Having seen his last fight, Shi Yu was cautious about Zhou Yuan. He immediately opened his three meridians and went in for the offensive. He threw his hand towards Zhou Yuan, but was rattled by Zhou Yuan's focused expression. Zhou Yuan, with incredible reflexes, activated the dragon's pace. Shi Yu was perplexed as his strike missed Zhou Yuan completely. Before Shi Yu could collect his footing, Zhou Yuan circled around and came up behind him. Zhou Yuan saw that Shi Yu's weak spot was open and quickly landed a strike with unbelievable force, sending Shi Yu flying across the arena. Shi Yu's body landed and skidded across the floor, but he quickly managed to get back up. He looked ahead to find Zhou Yuan, but Zhou Yuan was incredibly fast and had managed to get behind him. Zhou Yuan simply reached out and placed his hand on Shi Yu's head. A sudden feeling of terror overwhelmed Shi Yu. He could sense the sheer strength that Zhou Yuan possessed and imagined it as though a dragon's claw was crushing his skull. Trembling with fear, he stammered out that he had given up and forfeited the fight. The crowd broke out in cheers. Their perception of Zhou Yuan had changed entirely, and now they found him to be awesome, thinking that he had been hiding his strength all this time. Liu Shi booed Zhou Yuan from up on the balcony. She sneered, saying that he was good for nothing, visibly irritated by the result of the fight. Qi Yue noted that Zhou Yuan's physique was impressive and estimated that now he might have been as powerful as someone that had opened four meridians. He addressed Lin Feng, informing him that they were counting on him now. Lin Feng, who was seething with rage, was confident that Zhou Yuan couldn't defeat him. On the other balcony, Headmaster Chu had come to a similar conclusion that Zhou Yuan appeared to be as strong as someone who had opened four meridians. However, he additionally noted that the fluctuations of his source qi were not as powerful with four opened meridians. Zhou Yuan and Su Yue had met up again and they carried on conversing. Zhou Yuan looked up at the balcony where Qi Yue was, concerned about what he might be plotting next. 
Chi Yue met his eye and, with an evil smile on his face, gestured, slitting his throat as an obvious threat. Su Yue called out to Zhou Yuan, who returned back to her. Zhou Yuan was frustrated by Chi Yue's antics, but decided that he'd just go along with them for now and thought he'd get his chance to settle things during the school test at the end of the year. The big test was in full swing. Zhou Yuan managed to defeat two more opponents, both of whom had opened three meridians. Those victories had put him in the top 20. He knew that he needed just one more win to enter the top 10. Su Yu Wei was in the arena in the middle of a fight. She landed a direct blow on an opponent twice her size, taking him out, and the announcer's voice boomed, declaring her the winner of the match. Su Yu Wei had successfully managed to enter the top 10. The audience was in awe of Su Yu Wei, recognizing her last move as the jade crushing finger. They sang her praise because it was an intermediate level source skill that was very difficult. Su Yu Wei casually hopped out of the arena where Zhou Yuan was already waiting for her. She cheerfully asked him about her performance, and Zhou Yuan told her it was awesome. Su Yu Wei explained that, as she had expected, the Jade Crushing Finger was a powerful skill that was strong enough to defeat a person who had opened for meridians. Zhou Yuan agreed, and said he too would be defeated if she attacked him with the skill. Before Zhou Yuan could finish his thought, the announcer's voice interrupted him, thundering in the air. It announced the next competition, which was between Zhou Yuan and Lin Feng. The announcement took aback Su Yue and the crowd went mad. Su Yue fretted, knowing that Lin Feng was the most powerful expert amongst those who had opened their four meridians. She thought that this was a terrible outcome because she wasn't sure that even she could defeat Lin Feng, let alone Zhou Yuan. People in the crowd commented on Zhou Yuan's unfortunate matchup, and Zhou was all but certain that Qi Yue was responsible for this. He looked up at Qi Yue and Lin Feng on the balcony. Headmaster Chu was infuriated by this matchup. He had figured that the match was an arrangement made by Qi Yue. He angrily vowed that whoever was in charge of the big test and allowed Qi Yue to make these arrangements would be driven away from the school of the Great Zhou Empire. Lin Feng jumped out directly from the balcony and gracefully landed in the middle of the arena to face off with Zhou Yuan, who was already there. Lin Feng mocked Zhou Yuan by saying that he was surprised and never expected him to come this far. Zhou Yuan retorted and said that he had prepared even more surprises for Lin Feng. Lin Feng scoffed, and the two stared off. The announcer started the contest, and two combatants darted straight for each other. Lin Feng struck first. He kicked Zhou Yuan, aiming directly for his face. Zhou Yuan raised his hand to block the attack. Zhou Yuan threw a punch at Lin Feng's face. Lin Feng countered with his own punch. Their fists collided with each other with a loud bang, sending both of them backward. They regained their balance and faced off once again. The crowd was in an uproar, thoroughly entertained by the fierce battle. They could not fathom how Zhou Yuan, who only had two meridians opened, was such an evenly matched opponent for Lin Feng, who had four meridians opened. Lin Feng opened his four meridians and Zhou Yuan watched him with complete concentration. The audience worried for Zhou Yuan. With incredible speed, Lin Feng dashed, fist first, directly at Zhou Yuan. Zhou Yuan noticed Lin Feng's strength increased dramatically when he opened his four meridians. He shifted his feet and employed the dragon's pace, nearly avoiding contact with Lin Feng's attack. Lin Feng couldn't understand why Zhou Yuan's movements were so strange, but he decided to counter with an intermediate source skill of his own. The demonic bull's stomp. He slammed his foot down on the ground with tremendous force, throwing Zhou Yuan off balance. The dragon's pace was interrupted, and Lin Feng seized the opportunity to throw another powerful punch at Zhou Yuan. Zhou Yuan, with his quick reflexes, threw his arms in front of him to block the attack while simultaneously opening both of his meridians to strengthen his body. Lin Feng's punch made contact with tremendous force, sending Zhou Yuan skidding across the arena. The people in the crowd were shocked. They thought defending from such an attack was impossible, but Zhou Yuan was still on his feet. Lin Feng acknowledged Zhou Yuan's tenacity. Zhou Yuan smiled and stood up straight, shaking his arm, which was hurting from the pain of the impact. Lin Feng stared at him ferociously as he returned to his fighting stance, threatening Zhou Yuan that after his next hit, Zhou Yuan would be so injured he'd have to roll off the arena. Zhou Yuan smirked at the remark, growing more confident in his abilities. He taunted Lin Feng by saying he wouldn't get the opportunity to attack him again. Lin Feng was infuriated by Zhou Yuan's arrogance and promised he would destroy his self-confidence completely in front of everyone. Lin Feng powered up, charging his body in preparation to use all of his strength. The audience noted the terrifying Source Qi that gathered around him and marveled at his strength. 
Zhou Yuan sneered, seemingly excited that Lin Feng was finally using his full strength. Suddenly, energy surged around Zhou Yuan's body, and multiple source patterns lit up on different parts of his body. The iron skin source pattern on his forearm, the raging bull source pattern on his back, and the agility source pattern on his leg activated simultaneously. Zhou Yuan screamed out that he wasn't intimidated by Lin Feng and charged right at him to attack. The crowd was baffled by Zhou Yuan's ability to activate three source patterns simultaneously and noted that his momentum could now rival Lin Feng's. Up in his perch, Qi Yue laughed. He had noticed that Zhou had made a grave mistake. He explained to Liu Shi that Zhou Yuan did not know that what Lin Feng was good at was not offense, but defense. Just that moment on the battlefield, Lin Feng activated another intermediate level source skill, the Iron Demon Wall. Zhou Yuan, as he charged toward Lin Feng, noticed the force field that suddenly surrounded him and recognized it as the Iron Demon Wall. Su Yue in the crowd recalled how the Iron Demon Wall functioned. It was a top-tier source skill, and if the energy shield was not destroyed instantly, the damage from any attack would bounce back to the attacker. She knew that even she would have had difficulty dealing with it. Lin Feng was excited at the thought of Zhou Yuan being defeated by his own attack and humiliating himself in front of everyone. Zhou Yuan smiled cheekily and taunted Lin Feng by calling his energy shield a turtle shell. He boldly stated that he would break through it right before his eyes. As he approached Lin Feng's energy field, Lin Feng spotted another glowing pattern on his neck. He was stunned because he didn't expect Zhou Yuan to have any more source patterns, and even more so because he had never seen this particular source pattern before. The glowing pattern on Zhou Yuan's neck was the tiger's roar pattern. His eyes glowed red, and he opened his mouth wide like a lion about to roar. He unleashed a deafening sound wave so powerful that it swept the entire arena. Even the spectators were terrified and covered their ears. Judging from the sheer power of the source pattern, the crowd determined that it was definitely not an elementary source pattern. Lin Feng, who was the closest to the origin of the sound, was left trembling from the impact. As the sound wave collided with the energy shield of the Iron Demon Wall with immense force, it left several ripples on its surface. Before the shock from the first attack had even worn down, Zhou Yuan immediately positioned himself for the next, facing his palm towards Lin Feng as he employed the Dragon Tablet Palm. Zhou Yuan balled his hand into a fist, bringing it into contact with Lin Feng's Iron Demon Wall. With complete concentration, he activated Crush Mountain. The extreme force of the Dragon Tablet Palm pushed into the energy shield, creating a dent. Zhou Yuan cried out as his punch thrust deeper into the barrier. Zhou Yuan's incredible strength dumbfounded Lin Feng. Zhou Yuan yelled again as he poured all his energy into his attack until the energy shield finally started to crack. Lin Feng was horrified. Realizing his inevitable loss, he started to surrender. Before he could get the words out, Zhou Yuan's punch broke through the energy shield, shattering it to pieces, and connected with Lin Feng's chest, dead center, knocking the wind out of him. The force of the punch launched Lin Feng into the air. The crowd was left speechless, and Qi Yue, at his post, gritted his teeth in nervous anger. Lin Feng's body was sent flying over the group of spectators and crashed all the way over inside the next battle arena. The announcer's voice echoed, declaring Zhou Yuan to be the winner of the contest. The crowd erupted into cheers and applause as they celebrated Zhou Yuan's victory, admiring his incredible strength and amazed at how he managed to win. Headmaster Chu was ecstatic, noting that Zhou Yuan's final attack was far stronger than the attacks of others that had opened two meridians. Headmaster Zhu scowled with frustration. Su Yue was in disbelief from the fight, but ultimately relieved that Zhou Yuan had succeeded. Exasperated, Qi Yue clutched the glass in his hand so hard that it shattered into pieces. Liu Xi couldn't believe what had just happened and asked how it was possible that Zhou Yuan had broken the Iron Demon Wall. His teeth gritted from anger, Qi Yue began to question if his plan would succeed or if Zhou Yuan would turn things around. The crowd was still in an uproar, praising Zhou Yuan's strength as he triumphantly climbed down from the arena. Su Yue patiently awaited him at the bottom of the stairs. He smiled boastfully and asked her if she was impressed. Su Yue huffed, visibly upset, and said he was really good at hiding his strength. She was angry that she had spent all this time worrying about him for no reason. Qi Yue and Liu Shi watched the two down in the arena as they discussed the situation. Liu Shi told Qi Yue that since Zhou Yuan had defeated Lin Feng, he was sure to become the number one among the freshmen. Qi Yue was shaking from anger as Liu Shi continued to slander Zhou Yuan. 
She was annoyed that he was being conceited and that the winner of the big test shouldn't be bragging about his victory. She stated that Lin Feng was so weak compared to Qi Yue that he wouldn't dare to attack him. Qi Yue was still seething with rage and said that he didn't care if Lin Feng joined the Alpha Academy now. He swore that during the school test at the end of the year, he would personally knock Zhou Yuan back into the abyss and vowed that the school of the great Zhou Empire would fall into the hands of the family of Emperor Qi. The big test had ended, and the excitement simmered down. It was time for the admission ceremony, where the students had to select the school they wished to join. Headmaster Chu, along with Headmaster Shu, explained to an assembly of students that as long as they met the requirements, they were free to join either academy. He asked the students if they wished to join the Alpha Academy. The students in front of him remained silent. The top ten students from the test had been assembled into two rows. Headmaster Shu then offered that they could join the Beta Academy and touted that it had been ranked first in the school test for the past two years. Several students eagerly accepted the offer to join the Beta Academy. Headmaster Shu was delighted as he inducted almost all the students into his academy. Headmaster Chu glared at him suspiciously. Headmaster Chu recalled how several years ago, almost all of the top ten students would have certainly chosen to join the Alpha Academy, and now barely anyone did. He feared that the Alpha Academy was in decline. Zhou Yuan interrupted his thoughts as he raised his hand, stating that he wanted to join the Alpha Academy. Su Yue said the same, and so did a third person, a girl behind them wearing a panda hat. Headmaster Chu disregarded his negative thoughts and felt content that the two best applicants were joining his academy. He gladly inducted the three of them into the Alpha Academy. Su Yue turned to Zhou Yuan, filled with joy, and thought that Zhou Yuan might even yield spectacular results in the school test. Thank you for sticking around till the end. We hope you've enjoyed this recap so far. Make sure to like and subscribe to the channel. Make sure to hit the bell icon to be notified of our next uploads and comment your thoughts about the manhua down below. We'll be back with the next part soon.